Hey everyone, welcome, welcome. If you're jumping in here, give me a shout in the chat so we know you guys can hear me and it sounds okay. And for all you guys that have been waiting, I'm really sorry. I made a rookie mistake this morning and I did a Windows update that took like 30 minutes. So I'm a few minutes late. I'm sorry about that, guys. Well, everybody's, yeah. Chris, how's it going, man? So I assume you can hear me. I'm sounding good, sounding fresh. I gotta get some ref going. Sweet, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, so, oh, did I not load that one in there? I'm just picking up from a previous stream a few weeks ago, which it has been, I think, two or three weeks now. Let's go. That's the one I want. I'm also going to throw everybody my Insta handles if anybody wants to follow. <clears throat> Never Windows update. You're so right. I, I was prepping this morning and I was getting just endless updates. Like it kept telling me it wants to update. And, you know, of course, like my default is like, no, no, no. And uh, only when ZBrush gives me updates, that's when I say yes, yes. Um, but Windows, no, absolutely. But I just thought... I just had a little system reset with our IT people, and I just assumed that it had been auto-updating already, so it couldn't be a long, full update, but never make that assumption. That's just uh, rule number one. So for all you guys that are jumping in here, I am picking up from a previous stream. Uh, this is uh, going through, I'm using ZBrush 2020.1.1, by the way, which uh, if you guys go to zbrushcentral.com, you'll find on the top row or the bottom row, or second row, we have all the information for this latest update. So I'm gonna be using that version, which is uh, some small fixes and things that we've done to improve ZBrush 2020, of course. And uh, the stream, the previous stream, of course, if you guys you know go to zbrushlive.com, you should, and actually, you know what, e easy, even better, let's go YouTube, Pixelogic ZBrush, on the YouTube channel, just FYI for anybody who didn't see the last stream, in the top of our playlist, you should see uh, the first stream is here. So going through and actually making this thing. So I'm gonna pick up from where I left off. If anybody's tuning in or coming back, I really appreciate you guys coming back to check this one out. Um, and so today I actually wanna I wanna go into, because the goal here is to, um, I mentioned in the first stream, I'm gonna be doing this for a friend and I'm actually gonna 3D print this. So I wanna do a full scale and I wanna hollow this thing out. Um, I got a lot of sort of technical things to figure out. Uh, but the construction, all the process going through that has been covered in that first stream. So today I'm gonna go in and add some more stuff. I'm trying to figure out like a scene here. So anybody who's got crits or thoughts or ideas on this uh, Mando sort of setup, uh, feel free to throw it out there just to give you guys maybe like a little, a little mock-up here of what I'm thinking. So I kind of just like quick sketched this out this morning. And so I got the helmet done. And the helmet that we have here, uh, the, where I left off, I'm gonna go through the hollowing stuff with you guys and actually uh, using some of the more um, 3D print savvy features in ZBrush to like really like, clear out all the space, uh, cut out, gut out all the sort of uh, plate, the glass plate here, this portion here has gotta be cleaned out so I can actually put some uh, sort of transparent material in there. Uh, so the final shell I'm gonna be going to is going from here today, which is uh, a certain format uh, called panel loops. So that's all covered in the first stream of how to use panel loops and make all these shapes. So I'm not necessarily relying on topology and all these other like traditional ways of modeling to do it and I get to use brushes in a more sort of like free flowy sculptural kind of way. All that's covered in that first stream. Now, uh, so going from this, like the, one of the best things about the panel loops is I can make all these parts, I can get hard edges and get into the hard surface elements inside a ZBrush. But then one of the negative sides of what I don't love is like the CG edges, like these two these edges are just way too crisp. So going into like do some cleanup here and sort of 
start to just round out the edges, soften it out, give it more of like a realistic sort of malleable kind of look. But then mainly getting to this point here where we can start to hollow out all these shells and just like kind of go through that process. So I've done that. At least I know what direction I want to head in uh, this space. So I've got the sort of mock-up here. Um, and what I've got is, I'm just thinking this is me brainstorming. Like I know like Mando's got his, his rifle. He's a specific type of rifle. And I was trying to figure out like what to stand it on. And so I want to be able to like take it off, put it on, or just have it be like an ornament, like a, just a thing that can just sit. Um, and you know, I think for my friend, he wants it to just like be on his bar or something like that. So anyway, so I'm thinking like maybe using the gun, sort of the edge of the gun rifle to sort of be the stand and maybe some sort of like mechy kind of cylindrical base. But then I was kind of playing around with the idea of his, uh, and I see you've got a question, Chris, I'll get to that in a second. Um, just pulling up like a quick sort of like reference point here like he's got a bunch of belts and things I was just trying to come up with ideas of like what to make so I'm thinking like maybe the belt some of his straps and things could be a nice little addition on the base you know he's got this like particular type of ammo that he loads on the show if you watched it so like maybe doing some like leather straps getting in some buckles and these sort of things and make that be the base so I think that's the plan if you guys have ideas throw that stuff out there that's kind of what I'm gonna work towards is getting to making those things and finalizing this to scale, outputting to scale, once we um, get all the parts made and hollowing out all this stuff. So your question though, Chris, let me take a look. Uh, you're saying why sometimes flat parts don't really come out flat? Something when I 3D print things, the flat side has a slight angle to it. Mm, interesting, some flat parts don't come out flat. So you mean like if you were to go in and print out like a cube, like edges like this, um, I'm trying to make sure like I understand the how this visualizes because I mean if you have a I mean obviously with a full sort of CG hard edge the printer most of those single extruder printers I don't know what you're printing on if that thing's aligned flat to the bed itself even sometimes the beds might have just the slightest bit of distortion you also get sort of depending on the, the filament and the or rather the material um, you're gonna get rounding of edges but I'm thinking you're talking about something different. Um, I'd have to kind of like get an idea of what you mean. As long as that thing is sitting without perspective, right, it's sitting perfectly flat, it should come out flat. Could be the printer settings, so I did it a few times because of the settings. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Toast is throwing that out there. Or angle, angle of the print is a good point. He's, uh, Toast is talking about, or Toasted is talking about angle, which yeah, absolutely, if you're, a lot of times you'll, you'll align something here that you can get supports. Like if it's a single extruder, you know, doing like PLA or some kind of plastic, or you know, even with resin printers, you're gonna get support systems are gonna build if it's building up, right? So the angle could somehow have some kind of distortion and maybe not be able to do a perfectly flat uh, sort of piece. It showed up in the slicer, you always catch it before you try to print it. Yeah, uh, just point of reference, Chris, what uh, printer are you using? and what software are you using to slice? If it, if it's, if it has to be a pure flat surface, because you're dealing with, there's so many things you're dealing with, I mean, in terms of physics, like you're gonna have gravity, you have a, a, an extruder, if you're using an extruder type printer, or even a, you know something like a form that's like growing out of resin, you're gonna get all these other factors that play a part, and gravity included. So if it is angled, as Tosa mentioned, that could be it. Uh, if you were to build it straight, like if, it, you know, cube is like the best example where you have flat surfaces, if you're going straight up, building up, if that thing is flat on the bottom, not angled in any way like this, that's probably gonna be your best option to make it pure, using the Pusa MK25. Okay, I am I know of it, but I have had not used that one myself or their slicing software. It's possible it could be something within their software itself. Because personally, I mean, I've used, I mean, everything from Form Labs to MakerBots to Ultimaker, those sort of like the more well-known, I guess, printers. The software that you use, you know, whether it be Cura or any of the other ones, uh, we at Pixelogic have experimented with, experimented with these ourselves, and those ones don't seem to have issues in terms of getting those flat kind of surfaces. So it's possible it could be something within that slicing software too. But I, yeah, so I'll, I'm gonna get started with all this stuff, but I 
I would investigate that and um, see maybe, and it looks like Tosin's giving you some comments there too on his experiences. So hopefully that will kind of give you an idea. Uh, so then moving on to get started today since I'm a little late, I'm gonna try and push this, it's 1120, I'm gonna go to like maybe 120 or so, see how far I can go. So I wanna get to here and this particular process, we originally left off with this. So the first item that I really wanna tackle is I made a bunch of these parts. Each one of these parts and components is you know, individual. It's better to model this way, you know, when you get these individual components. I loved a push and see modeler a lot, which I'll probably use a lot more of that to do my polygon modeling and things like that. So all this stuff is separate components that I'm gonna to have to start consolidating and figure out how it's all gonna work in terms of like the printer that I might use. I'm looking at, depending on when I do this, I'm looking at maybe doing the Form 3L if that's gonna be available soon. If not, I might try the Form 2. Um, but I'm kind of up in the air at this point of what I'm going to use. But in terms of the, the print bed itself, it's probably not going to fit a full-size helmet. Even the 3L I don't think is going to fit the full-size helmet. So that being the case, I'm probably going to have to break some of these parts off. But first and foremost, I just want to get everything together. And I want to be able to shell all this stuff out. So that way I can figure out how to maybe cut it in half and maybe you know piece it together so it kind of like closes up in this way. And then I can seal it up with some sort of adhesive. Um, so then, but the first thing before I even get to consolidating all these parts is I want to kind of go through cleanup, like I mentioned, kind of getting rid of the edge, um, sort of uh, the CG edge, those pure hard edges that are um, a little too too much for me. I want to get more of that soft sort of metallic kind of look. So if you like really go in and you look at, you know, those edges, it's a pretty rounded out sort of piece of metal. So I want to kind of capture that to make sure that shows up in the high quality version, right? So to do that, so reposition this. Just some simple stuff that we can do with uh, some, say like deformers, uh, to do a little bit of smoothing. So Dynamesh is usually, a remesh of this is gonna be best. Like taking this thing, if you watch the first stream, panel lip surfaces come from, a di we're using Dynamesh to kind of work, we're using panel lips and then do the extrusions and get the sort of insetting. And if you were to go through and just divide this thing, a problem that you get when you divide, divide's gonna help soften out those edges, but the way that those triangles are created, especially or that geometry is created along those borders, especially with Dynamesh, is you're gonna end up starting to get some of these little like uh, like lumpy points, right? So it's just the algorithm and the way it divides the geometry, it just doesn't look good. So it's actually a little bit better. I'm gonna go into like remeshing, but we can clean this up. So with no subdivisions, we could just take this thing and probably just Dynamesh this guy at a high enough res to capture. I want to keep all the same quality here. So we go up a few thousand, do no blur and no sub projection. Okay, so that thing just remesh and here we've got, okay, so it's if I undo, redo, it's keeping those edges. That looks pretty good. Um, so it went up to like around 5 million at about 1,500. So the active, the resolution number is never going to correlate to, you're not going to know what that thing's going to give you. This all depends on the scale of the object. So if I were to take this thing in ZBrush and actually scale it up and Dynamesh it, I'm going to get a different remesh if I were to go back and undo that. So I'm just kind of looking at more for like what the total number is. Like a few million is pretty good. Uh, that way, like when, when you're up in higher resolutions, if you hold like shift and you go in, oops, turn off. So I'm using spotlight, so I'm turning off the spotlight for reference. I'm turning off the brush samples spotlight projection button so I can use my brushes while that stuff is there. But at higher reses, when you hold shift, even at maximum smooth, it's still going to keep a lot of that shape without losing so much. Whereas if you were a lot lower, it's going to just destroy it. So in this case, higher is better when I want to do just like a procedural smooth. So if you turn on the gizmo and we go, so gizmo for these deformers, we're gonna turn symmetry off. I'm gonna to go to customize and there's that smooth all, which I like to push this one a lot. I love this procedural. This one smooths very, this one smooths differently than if you use like deformation polish, right? This one's gonna smooth a lot different. Um, it's gonna be a, a easier way to go through and get a clean smooth effect. So if you run and do like, a, if you do a polish, just straight polish, I only did 10 because of the high, high active counts like this. It's going to take quite a while. But what Polish does is it does smooth it all out. 
but at the borders, you start to get this little inflated edge around the edge border. So when it meets a corner like that, you get this inflate. So it's just how the algorithm works. But instead of using that one, if we go to Gizmo, click the Smooth All. When you turn it on by default, it's going to do it's a 20 or 30 percent. Or it's really no percentage, but it's it smooths a, a factor of 37 out of it can go to a maximum I think of 1,000. So if you just let it do its thing at the beginning, it's doing just a tiny bit of smooth. And you can click and drag this cone to do more smoothing. But what if, especially when you're dealing with these high reses, if you take that thing and drag it, it's gonna take quite a while to process, so you might have to wait too long. So you can let it do it right away when you turn it on. You can go ahead and go back here and click accept, and then go turn it on one more time. So you just double that 37. Now we're up a little bit higher. So I just ran that. And all that's doing is just running a slight bit of smooth. So if I undo, undo, there you go. We're going from this to this to this. You get just a little bit more smooth. So I just did that to the whole helmet itself first. All right, and that's going to be the first step. Now, the one thing I do want to do, though, before I even uh, get into, like, I guess we could kind of keep this as is. Like, one thing I noticed after the last stream is I went through and I did these little sort of mechanical components he's got here in the back of the helmet but the helmet itself is kind of running into it so there's a little bit of space that's sort of cut into the object so what I need to do here is cut out or shell out that space so I can have enough room for those pieces which the live boolean system is really the best way to do stuff like this I mean we could you know what we could just take this with straight dynamesh though and Maybe, you know what, don't create extra work if you don't have to. We can literally just go in here. It's just space. Inverse that. Let's turn gizmo on. Alt click to bring this thing. Oops. So I did a mask. It's going to travel through the object. So I need to go mask up front. And then let's just punch this back. So I'm just trying to create enough space. Now thinking about like the print stuff, right? Like I don't want to leave, this is empty space sitting behind there. So if you're dealing with like supports, you never know, leaving gaps between objects is something we want to try to avoid as much as possible. So I'm going to maybe just kind of go in and just punch that back enough where it's still colliding with these pieces. So they have something to build from, which is uh, very important, right? It just saves a whole lot of time with cleanup and it could create a, a sort of thin little piece depending on what kind of material I'm going to use. So I have the accentuation of that sort of like extrusion, but that should be probably enough. Uh, side effects, what's up? <laughs> How you doing? It's been a few weeks. So I got that little extrusion, which that's good enough for me. But the next thing I want to do before, now I'm starting to get into like, I want to consolidate all the parts, like taking a look at this final piece. Right, so this is everything combined into one. We want to get to this space. But to get an object here that we can use, what we're going to use is live booleans to cut out the shell in that space inside the helmet itself. So we need to get an object that's going to be able to frame inside. Now Dynamesh offers a way to do shelling of any object. It's the only way that we can take an object and get an inset of the existing piece. So I'll show you what I mean if you're not familiar with this. Um, so before I go through and merge all these parts, I'm eventually going to dynamesh them all together. But I want to get an inner shell of the helmet with a little bit of thickness that I can use to subtract or cut out inside. So I'm talking about using the uh, geometry dynamesh create shell feature, which we'll go through that. Um, side effects, you said people are satisfied with the, the froggy and making with Widdlesbach. Oh, and each, so Widdlesbach will show you how to print. Nice, so you're, um, you've are you been checking on his streams, you're keeping up with him. The, is the froggy, is, is it froogy? Is, you just, is that a, just a typo? Somebody posted a frog the last time I was in this chat. I don't think that was you, but um, anyways, yeah, Thomas is a really cool guy. I love Thomas Widdlesbach. It was you, okay, sweet. So that piece you're actually going to print. That's so great to hear. Um, Wittelsbach knows his stuff, and he's a phenomenal artist, right? Just a down-to-earth, super awesome guy. Um, 
it's much better now. That's awesome. So I got this piece and I want to do my shell. So to make use of this create shell feature, this is, it's in it's functioning with the insert brushes to apply this create shell action. So we can't just click this, we actually have to go and do an action. So to do this, we're gonna go to brush, click I, and I'm just gonna go grab the IMM primitives, just to, and then I have the, what you guys should see is the IMM viewer, should be up here at the top, right? So this is my little custom UI, which if you got questions, um, feel free to uh, throw it out there about the UI and buttons if I'm not describing it. So the insert, I'm just gonna grab an insert sphere. And I'm gonna hold Alt, click and drag to drag a, a subtraction of the mesh. But before I go through and control drag to do anything, I'm just gonna bring the object outside of space. So the object, to do this action, the object does not have to be intersecting with the model. All right, so the goal, what this is really meant for is, like a lot of times if you're making something for, for prints or if you're gonna make a mold or anything like that, if you need to have like a drainage hole, if you were to clear, uh, basically, to run the Dynamesh and click Create Shell, it's gonna cut a hole out and it's gonna create a thickness between the inside and outside. But in this case, we don't wanna create a hole, we just wanna create the thickness of the object. So bringing it out in space is perfectly fine. It's better that way so you don't get any in adds or subtracts with the Boolean, with the Dynamesh Boolean. So all we're gonna do is clear the mask and we're gonna click Create Shell. And this is gonna go in and this is gonna make it. Now, the resolution of the Dynamesh here plays a really big part in how long this takes. So a little pro tip here, I'm gonna see if I can, let me see if I can kill this. I'm just gonna hold escape and try and kill this process. If that Dynamesh res is super high, it's five million, it's basically gonna make, it's gonna take the helmet, it's gonna make another version of it that's Dynamesh inside at a, a, a thickness of four, which doesn't have any real sort of units of, of measurement yet. Um, so we haven't defined that, but it's a sort of like a rudimentary number. So let me see if I can kill this guy. So you can press escape to kill a dynamesh, but I might have forced it a little too much. Let me just take a look at the chat while that's going. Uh, thanks, side effects. I appreciate that. And you sent. Oh, nice. That is looking great. You really put a lot of work in there. And I like that turntable too. Very cool. That's going to be a great print. I'll be sure to follow back as well. Come on, you can do it. All right, I'm just gonna force that. So instead of like that could have taken, I don't know, a couple minutes or whatever. I should have just left it. Let's go load this quick save. So real quick, what I'm gonna do actually to start off too, and this might be a good rule of thumb if you do end up following along with this process, is I always wanna keep my panel loop helmet uh, just in case. There's parts that I might wanna extract from it. I have polygroups. Uh, these polygroups make a big part in like, if I wanted to make an extraction later as like an additional part for the final piece, I could go do mask this off, do subtool extract to get another piece. Like I could go in, okay. Let's go grab this, mask it off. Like little stuff like this, I could extract and accept, and I got another plate of this piece, right? A little extrusion. So you never know what those, what that original piece is going to offer you. So it might be better, anyways, that I've kind of gone through to start over. Let's just duplicate it. We'll call this one Diana Cleanup. We'll turn off that original panel loops. Let's go Dynamesh. I think I had it around 14, 1500. I'll remesh this thing. Uh, Artisan, you're saying the dark blue UI. This is uh, this is my custom UI. So uh, I went through and I changed those colors, which you can do inside of preferences, uh, interface, or no, sorry, those are eye colors. All right, so you got the main, right? You can change the main one and main two, which is just the main frame. And then in here, like I've changed SW and S2 to some of the button colors. Um, I've got through and changed some of the frame colors for these guys. So like. 
these transitional colors here. You can do all that stuff on your own. So I sometimes I just get, you know, I need to change up my, my grays. I don't want to see too much gray these days. Um, yeah, thanks. If uh, if you want it, I can upload it uh, during the stream here for you for you guys. And actually, you know what? Um, I'll post a link later. Actually, if you follow, go to ZBrush Central and look for Sir underscore Scallywag, this same name here, my ZBrush Central post, I have uh, I posted my custom UI and my custom hotkeys. That's all there, which you can find on ZBC under that that name. Sir Scallywag is the one I kind of use for all my art stuff. Um. Poly Workshop, you're saying audio is not good on YouTube. Um, oh, darn. I don't know what I could do about that. How about everybody else? If you guys aren't listening on YouTube, give me a shot how that audio is sounding. And while you guys are checking, I'm just going to run this smooth all. So I'm just getting a little bit of smooth. Just one smooth all. And now I got my Dyna. Now, so this is my, we'll call this Dyna. So I'm going to call it helmet outer shell because I'm going to make a duplicate for this to get the inner shell. So copy it. <clears throat> MS Wild saying it sounds good on Twitch. Maybe um, if you're watching on YouTube, if you have the option to go to Twitch, maybe check it out there. I don't know why. It, we're using OBS, which pushes everything out, and it should be the same consistently. So maybe on uh, chat on YouTube says it's fine. So maybe... Um, if you're having issues, maybe just check your sound settings or something. It may be something going on, or maybe a connection issue. So this, I duplicated the outer shell, and I'm gonna call this one inner for now. All right, so turning off the original panel loops, we got just the outer shell, the outer shell here, and this duplicate to make the inner. Now for this one, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do that same action. Let's go brush, insert, grab that, insert sphere. I'm gonna hold Alt, drag it out, bring this object here, and clear the mask. So I haven't done any dynamesh, I just cleared the mask. So I'm gonna bring down the resolution, and what it's gonna do is remesh the whole thing, but in when I remesh it, instead of control dragging with dynamesh, I'm gonna click create and shell. I'm gonna leave the thickness at four. It should be, I'm gonna be able to manually scale this thing and do this on my own without using the thickness. But the shell part is gonna give us an inner sort of extrusion or an inner sort of, uh, extruded piece to go through and do a subtraction to. So you can reduce that resolution lower to make this go a little bit faster. Like I went down maybe half, I could have probably gone down like a quarter, down to like maybe a hundred and it would have been probably way quicker. It shouldn't take too long. PDF steps for the shell technique. <laughs> um, you know, the, they should be out there. Actually, if you guys go to, while it's going, I can just mention this. If you go to docs.pixelogic.com, docs.pixelogic.com, you can just type in Dynamesh in the search tab. And there should be just documentation. This is our online documentation site that you can actually go and you should be able to search. And that creates shell functionality should be there. Um, but yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot over this stuff. The steps are really draw an insert mesh, pull it out, clear the mask, click create shell, boom, it'll go through and process. But you see, there's the time that it's taking to go through and make this shell is really dependent on the settings, like bringing that resolution. It you don't need this thing to be super high resolution. I just need to get a piece that's going to go through and do a little bit of an inset and extrude it which, you know, I could easily maybe just make a duplicate, but just to show you guys that this feature is there, it has a lot of functionality that we can sort of make use of. And also, I, I don't know if I ruined it, but I actually, to get the stream started on time today, or closer to on time, if you guys hadn't heard it at the beginning, I was 
accidentally did a Windows update before, which took 30 minutes, and I just killed my machine and then booted it back up. So I don't even know if the update finished. I could be dealing with all kinds of stuff now. Uh, Soul Hacker, how's it going? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Count, you're saying Dynamish does not rely on powers of two, like UV maps? No, in this case, no. Uh, oh, I didn't see Omdagai X music. I uh, just came to see the great work. Seems right. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming back and tuning in. Those kind of compliments, they keep, they keep me going. <laughs> uh, so how can you say, how can I freeze the camera on ZBrush? Uh, if you want to lock the camera, what you can do is you go to, so here on the right side, you see you have this little camera with the lock. That button, whatever position the camera is in, that's going to lock the camera, but it'll still allow you to touch the object and things like that. So it's this is your best way to keep this here inside of the, the UI. My, mine's a little bit customized, but it should be about there. Okay, so this thing is done. All right, so you see, this is the time that took, and actually, it went up to 10 million. So the reason is, what I'm gonna do is go to Tool Palette, go down here to Double Display Properties, turn, make sure that's on. If you go, just cut the model in half here, and you take a look on the inside, we now have two, two objects, right? So two remeshes. So it's basically creating another version, and the thickness is just telling you how far it's gonna push it in but it's taking that whole object and just scaling it in. All right, so in short, the, the more you cut down, like you see the time that it took for me, uh, I guess that's a good example to show you how long that stuff can take, right? But to just, you know, put my money where my mouth is here, let's go back, and I dropped it down from 14, 1500 to 800, but let's say we just take this thing down a lot more, we'll go down to like maybe, let's just do 128, go much lower, and we'll do create shell again. So I just undid it, just so you guys can see. And this one should be much snappier. You see that one, boom, it went through and it did it. So we lost resolution on the outside, which again, doesn't really matter as long as it's maintaining most of the shape. And now if you cut that thing in half, you should see that new piece on the inside. So there's two of them. So what we really want is just the inner part. All right, I just wanna grab the inner part here. And one thing that you can do though, is let's just take, let's try a little experiment here. So you now have a, a border, so it has thickness. The object has thickness, but it's a closed shell. So if we were to just go in, let's just say I grab, I'm gonna grab this uh, panel loops, this original panel loops one here. And I'm gonna go mask off, this is where the, the benefit comes in. I can mask off that bottom piece. And just for this one that we did the, the shell thickness on, if we go to this one, let's do extract. Wait, no, actually what I wanna do is shrink it so control click a bunch so I'm shrinking to just get a little bit of distance or space between it and I'm going to do extract and let's just do accept so we got this new piece now this piece if we bring this down below that helmet what we're going to do here is use the live boolean system to just kind of experiment with actually cutting out to see the inside of the helmet so let's go in and I'm going to grab this uh, oops let's just clear that mask grab a new brush so if we set, we got this helmet here. If we set a, so start groups I'm gonna do, I can set a start group below. I'd only wanna deal with booleans for these two pieces. So I'm gonna set a start group for the helmet and this one I'm gonna set to subtract. So that's this little shell extrusion or extraction. That one's set to subtract. This start group means that this one won't interact with any of the other objects below the subtool tree. So any of these other pieces, that boolean's not gonna to touch. Just in case, it's so just save face here. So we'll turn on live booleans. And now you'll see that that's gonna go through and do a little subtraction upwards into that helmet. But let's say we take just this poly group, mask it off. Let's go grab the gizmo and literally just pull, oops, inverse that, pull this straight up. So we're pushing this into the model. So you'll see if I show everything, it's now basically taking it from here and it's gonna punch it all the way through. All right, so this piece, I really just wanted to cut out the bottom. So let's just maybe, what we can do is maybe go, just so you can see what's happening here. Let me just taper that piece so it's got a little curvature. And then now we have this piece here that we can literally take, if you turn on polyframe, we'll see this. 
we'll just take this thing and we can pull this out, pull this in to figure it out. So all I need to do is have this thing just barely punch through. And then once it reaches that wall thickness, then you get a full cutout. All right, so you can see what's happening on the inside. Um, and real quick too, Soul Hacker, since you mentioned, or you asked about the camera, if you, just so you see, if I click lock, if I click on the document space, now nah, I'm good, I can't touch anything. But I can go in and I can move stuff around, I can mess with the objects. That, for me, I find that really helpful, uh, especially sometimes when like you get to, you got a brush and you're accidentally, you're trying to click on an edge, but you click on the document like this and you rotate. It can get frustrating if you're like trying to do like little minor changes. So if you lock that thing, then you can go in freely no matter what, you won't hit that document navigation. Um, so then this is the general sort of like workflow. So I got, I can do this quick little subtraction. But if I want to modify the inside piece and I want to make changes to it, maybe I want to scale it up, I'm basically locked to this original object here that we did that, create shell. These are two objects, so you're basically two shells merged together. But if I extract out that inner shell, I can clean up all the inside, the remesh that create shell does a, its own kind of remesh. So you end up getting a surface like this, which shows right in the, the preview. So if I don't want the inside of the helmet to look like this, maybe I want to clean it up, change the shape, or maybe make it uh, be even thinner or thicker on the inside. So create more space from the outer shell to the inner shell. It'd be a lot easier if I could use live booleans to then go in and modify that part. So what we're gonna do is we'll call this one um, put bottom boolean subtract. So you got a little piece there. And this, we're gonna change the start group. So we're gonna go turn on this is why I kept the original Dynamesh that's going to stand as the outer shell. Right? And then this inner shell one, we Dynamesh it a lot lower. So we don't care about this outer part. We want to grab that inner shell. So what we can do is if you just control shift click on the outer, any part of the outside shell and do visibility grow all, it's going to grow to the outer shell or to the completion of this shell itself. The inner part isn't connected to this in any way. There's no vertex points that are touching. So that wouldn't exist on its own. So if I control shift drag and reverse, I'm now showing the inner part. So now what I'm gonna do is geometry, modify top up, delete hidden, and I got this piece. So I'm gonna press control W to give it its own poly group. Sometimes it'll give you these sort of uh, Christmassy looking <laughs> poly groups. <laughs> yeah, voxelized. It's essentially that's what that algorithm is kind of uh, sort of remeshing like. So you get these sort of low res voxel like surfaces. So now this piece though is a separate sub tool. So I, I renamed that inner that I can now manipulate and move around and do stuff to. So then what's happening here is if I turn off that, that bottom subtraction, this piece, if we set that to subtract, this is now gonna subtract from, we'll set that helmet as the top. So this now becomes a subtraction inside. And then if we turn on that bottom piece, now we have the same thing. But now if I go back to this sort of voxelized uh, helmet, let's say I go to gizmo here and we'll turn on and click, we're going to click smooth all, but so you can see it, I'm going to go here to the bottom, hit the gizmo and let's do smooth all. And now it's smoothing out the inside of that piece. So if I click and drag, I'm now editing that inner part. So I just ran a smooth. It's still keeping most of the shape. Like you'll note the resolution is about a hundred thousand, which is a good number. If you remesh that lower to like 20 or 30,000, if you smooth all, it might destroy a lot of those shapes that are forming around the object that you made. Which you want to kind of keep those shapes, because if I keep smoothing, let's say I go like really far, you might run into like that piece you'll see right here, because you're using booleans, that smooth shape rounded out that part, which now intersects with the outer shell. So if I go in and I bring that back down, you see what you're, what's happening is you're losing that shape. Now, if you're making a different kind of helmet and you don't have these kind of like cuts and shapes in there, that might not matter. If it's just more of a circular sort of shape or a cylindrical shape, it wouldn't make much of a difference and you could shrink that thing down. But for this, these things are dipping into the surface. So I gotta think about those things when I'm, when I'm modeling. So I'm just getting a little bit more freedom to like play around with this stuff, right? So going back, I'm gonna do just a tiny bit of smooth, go in and click accept. Which if you're using that smooth all, just FYI, if you click smooth all, it's in a previewable state, which allows you to keep changing it. You have to click the customize gear icon and go accept, or you can delete, right? Otherwise, if you leave it on and go do other stuff, you might run into issues. So then in this case, I've got that thing kind of smoothed out, but the benefit here is I can take this object now 
And let's say I turn on gizmo, and I'm gonna turn symmetry off, which allows me to reset orientation and alt-click here to put this thing at the dead center of the object. If symmetry's on and I alt-click, it puts it at two sides. Just wanna go center, and then just go in, and I can start to scale this object, right? So if I undo it, I could also do stuff like this. I can shrink it in and basically readjust. So I can choose how much of that inner subtraction I want to be going through that model. And I can even go through and punch it down. Right, so we've basically just taken the, the frame of that piece and using that as a way to model and sort of customize that inner shell. Right, so I'm gonna leave it as is. I think that's gonna be fine. What I do wanna edit though is this little subtraction piece here. Um, and let me just check the chat too. Count, you like those gizmo tips and polish? Great, I'm just really glad to show that stuff. And Nightbot, you're saying, oh yeah, the point one point one update. Yep, that's a good call out for ZBC. Those of you guys that are watching, you can go to uh, ZBrush Central. He put the link in there, ZBC, the point one point one update. You guys should also get now, when you launch ZBrush, it'll tell you that there's an update. So it gives you a little update window, which is a nice little thing that we added for y'all. So this piece, this extraction, one thing that I like to do with this stuff is you get polygroups on both sides, and you'll see that that sub extraction came from this original pen loop, right? I just used the shape of this piece, and I shrunk it down. And in this case, I just wanted like enough of that oval kind of shape to have, and also the extract helps because you're getting it off the angle. So it's extracting off that piece, so it's already in position. It's a nice little chip to have. I could easily just like, this piece here as a subtraction, I could just insert a cylinder and use that to punch it in, but it, then I have to adjust it and I have to move it, doing extractions a little bit better. But one of the cons you get with extractions is you get the sort of wonky sort of shapes here from the, the extraction itself. So that shows up in my boolean, all right? So I get these little wonky edges. But it gives you polygroups, so polygroup, polygroup, polygroup. Mainly, the, what we use these for is we can go to deformation, and just like I used in the first stream, that's polished by features, if I just go open up that circle, run this, it's gonna start smoothing out those polygroup borders and give you cleaner surfaces. So basically, I don't even have to go through, I can undo, I don't have to select it with polyframe, I'm just showing that for you guys. But I can just select it, go into deformation, open up that circle, and I can run this all the way to 100, and I'm starting to get polishing at those borders. All right, and then last but not least, maybe I'll turn on gizmo, bring this thing to the center, and I might just go through, punch this thing out. Now, I don't want it to intersect, so you'll see right here, that subtraction is now running into the, the inner shell piece. So I don't want to collide it with that object, otherwise I might start cutting out. So I'm just getting a cleaner sort of little subtraction in there. All right. Now, one thing I didn't do in the stream, I'll turn on my, I set this up in the first stream, by the way, just the reference, the orthographic views we got here. One thing I'm missing is this piece, this little subtraction for that uh, sort of corner. So my original one, I left that there, mainly because I wanted to get to this phase where I have negative space in here now. I didn't have that before, it was just one closed shell. Um, so, Pixel logic. Oh, you're saying enable my headset mic? I, it is on. Come on, guys. <laughs> Give me some credit here. Headset mic is on. Maybe. How about this one? Nope, you guys don't hear me? Tell me if that sounds any different or better. It sounded fine until I just changed it. Okay, so you guys don't like that. Oh, but one of you says it's clean. Oh, I hate audio. This sounds, okay, two people say it's worse. I'm gonna go back to. How 
How about that? Better? Back to original. Okay. <sighs> Gotta figure this out, man. Um, okay, so somebody was asking a question about the, the booleans, I think. Uh, I made all the shapes. I made it all from shapes and booleans. Uh, actually, no. So the helmet itself, check out the, uh, if you want to see the stream, I'd say uh, go to our, pull this up, go to our YouTube channel, so Pixelogic ZBrush. The first stream is here, which is actually, um, just I'll just quickly like, no sound here, more sculptural. So we're taking a shape and we're going through and we actually can use, uh, so sketching out masks to get those shapes. And the polish by features allows us to crease sharp edges. So you're using more brushes and things to actually refine those shapes. So check that out. It's a it's a workflow that I love to use for hard surface and these kinds of shapes that don't require me to make. Because to make a boolean for that would be a, a hard. It would take more time to go through and make that shape and get it to fit with a boolean, as opposed to just like using topology and modeling and just pushing in edges and verts. You know. So I don't prefer to use the topology workflow if I can get around it. And ZBrush offers me the ability to do the polishing of this, which is all kind of covered in that that um, that first stream. <laughs> Chat says you listen through a string and styrofoam cup. Very nice. Yeah, that's how we also communicate at Pixelogic. We all have cans in our offices. <laughs> so this piece, right? Sorry if I'm a little distracted lately, but um, this piece here, I want to get this last little subtraction. So this one I'm going to boolean. So we're, we're setting up a few booleans to get the final final here. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to go in and I want to make that little boolean subtraction. And for me, the best way to do this is, let me save this spotlight because I'm going to have to go in and do a new one here, is I love to use Lightbox Spotlight. Let's go load this guy. So Spotlight has the Snapshot 3D feature, which allows us to make a 3D model from the alpha. So that shape, we go to the floor grid, that little piece here, a cool little trick is we can go in, I'm gonna grab this little diamond piece. So clicking and drag the orange circle, I can lock it to the center of the image. And I can go in, and now the model, you'll see has snapping points. So I can snap it to the center, which is like the mesh mid center here. I can scale this thing up like so, and Let's just go up and zoom up here a little bit more so we can see this more clearly. And then I'll reposition that. So snap, scale. So this is roughly the edge here, right? So I got that edge here and that edge here. So with this piece, if you go down with, so I click in Z, you get the spotlight wheel. And we have our little extend options. So these two are extend, these two are flip. So if you grab the, grab the red extend, it basically just takes that image and just extrudes it and stretches it out. So I can extend this baby over like so. And now I've got that thing in place and I wanna make this as a subtractive Boolean. So if you just click the snapshot 3D button, it makes it to a 3D mesh and it turns the subtool to the add option. If we alt click it, it's gonna make it, put it to subtract. And if live Booleans is on, if I just press shift C to turn everything off, turn the floor grid off, that's already going in and it's doing that little subtraction. And so I just immediately get that piece that's cutting out from that space. So it makes this into a polymesh 3D object. So then this piece, we'll call this like helmet sub two or three or whatever. Um, that one's pretty good. So now I at least got that stuff in there. Uh, toasted honey, so it looks like you didn't know about that one. Sweet, this is one of my favorite things to do. The snapshot 3D is pretty new. That came out in 2019. But that feature is um, a super, super fun feature to use. Um, you can do all kinds of things. Like we can literally just, uh, some of my other streams I actually use it a lot. So if you want to check out my previous streams, um, you can always go to zbrushlive.com. And if you go to presenters, A lot of us at Pixelogic, especially the developer side, Joseph, Paul, and myself, will use these things as much as possible. So I think I used it in uh, this one a lot. It's making that gun. I think I'm going to use it. Oh, that's a little too old. Some of the more, this most recent one, I believe, was using some snapshot 3D stuff just to make parts and pieces. Um, 
can you import your own alpha for the snapshot feature? Absolutely. All you need to do is the alpha is like this spotlight here. If you go to Lightbox Spotlight, these are ones that you can load. So if you double click these, these are just presets with all kinds of crazy shapes. But if you make a black and white image inside of Photoshop or whatever, you grab an alpha. If you just go to texture, import, so if you import that alpha, you can bring that in. So you basically just go texture. I'm just going to grab, let's see if we can find a, just like an image or whatever. If it's per, if it's pure black and white, like we grab this guy. If you then with the texture selected or the alpha, you can load it in there, click this add to spotlight and it brings that image here into spotlight. So I'm curious, I've never actually tried this, but if I click snapshot 3d, boom, it just made that piece. Right, so you get something like this. You get a full 3D mesh from that image. And that's just using one of those default textures inside of Spotlight. Um, yeah, this one's super, super awesome. You just, the, 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 be the benefit here is that you get something on the fly, like it's great for logos, it's great for, I use it for like all kinds of like stamps and bolts and things, um, but it, it has, it for, sort of forces you, like if I rotate the camera to like an angle here, and I go generate this piece, Snapshot 3D, you see it captures it at the depth or the angle of that camera. So depending on what you're trying to do, like if I was trying to go in here, let's say I wanna do like a little subtraction piece for this, like on this part of the helmet, if I rotate my camera like so, we go in here, we say put that there, we do alt click, it's going to generate that piece and it's going to push it in that depth of that camera. So it's trying to sort of match the angle. Um, but what it also does is if you solo that object out is it looks at whatever the, the, the base object is in that Boolean tree or the, the, the subtool sitting above it, it's going to do the thickness of that object. So it makes that thickness of that object. So it's going to do that kind of depth. So it, this piece I don't necessarily need to go as far. So I could go in and say scale it pull it back out. So that way it doesn't collide with any, any other pieces. Uh, but yeah, this is a you know super sweet feature to do these quick kind of shapes. Uh, the create object from alpha function in, in alpha it really is, isn't useful because of the spotlight function. Yeah, spotlight kind of trumps that now. Uh, definitely, it's got more functionality. It's a little bit denser. I mean, we came out with it later too. So I think that's all I really need for that. So I'm going to go load my reference spotlight here. So we have this piece. Let's go grab this one. And so we got that piece. That's pushing all the way back through the model. So as long as it doesn't collide with anything else, that's, uh, you know, shouldn't be a problem. If it does, what I could do is alt click on the front face, solo that thing out, alt click here. And then I could just take that piece and just grab the scale, and just punch that back. I only need it to go about there. All right, now the last thing I need to do though is I want to shell out the visor. And that's just so that way, because if I'm going to print it, like again, we're working towards the final final. So I want to leave that space open because if I'm going to print out that outer shell, if I do want to get like a plexiglass or some kind of cool material, I might be able to cut that out and just give me space to go in and just say like make up some, some little uh, keys or locks that I can just snap that thing into place. So I want to leave some options for that. I could just leave that as is and just try and print it that way. But I could foresee that being a problem if I want to, essentially if this thing doesn't fit the print bed, I might need to take the helmet and be able to basically connect it at the center. So take two parts and connect it so that way it'll be, it'll allow me to do full scale in that way. And most print beds, the standard ones that I'll probably be looking to use aren't gonna be able to fit this whole thing. Um, so then to make, to cut out that visor shape again, we're going to use booleans and the best way to do it, you can't do an alpha, a spotlight alpha to make that piece. That's going to be tough to make a custom piece. So again, going back to the original pen loop thing, it's a whole lot easier if I can do an extraction and use that to punch through with the boolean. So then if I take, let's just go grab, I'm going to make, grab this poly group. So going back to the panel, the original pen loop helmet from last stream. Grab this, mask it off. So I'm gonna grab it, mask it off. I don't even have to bring everything visible. I could just go in and click extract, and then let's click accept. Now I get a new piece. All right, so this new piece, we're gonna call this 
visor sub. I'm going to move this down in my tree. So I want this to be, so you see the helmet's at the top, everything else is subtracting from that until it meets the, so I'm setting that as my next one if I need to do any gluing. So this one, I actually don't even need any of those, really, those parts. But the extract itself, like the pin loops piece, you'll see that we lost a little bit of the sort of edging in there. So it rounded it out from the mask, which this is also covered in the first stream, but how to get those corner edges to be sharp again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go, so the extraction gives you those three polygroups. So you get the base polygroup, the polygroup at the border. This is the one we want to edit and modify. So if I control shift click on that, the thing is, is when you have, this is maybe a little pro tip, I don't know if you guys are aware, but if you control shift click on a polygroup, it isolates it, right? This one in particular, when, when you look at it, polygroups are actually selected when you click the vertex point, not the edge. So you, if I control shift click on the middle of this edge, it's finding one or the other point that allows me to select it. Here, you'll see I do, actually don't have an edge. So it, you'll see the point snaps across here. So if I click somewhere here in the middle, it works pretty well. If I click on this point here, the sort of pink salmon group is sharing this yellow, the same vertex point as the yellow. So when I click that point, it grabs both. So you kind of have to click right here in the middle and that'll have sort of like a smart select to grab just that one. It's just little things you might end up running into like, oh, I clicked both and I gotta click that one to turn it off. Sometimes it can be a nuisance. So turning double side on so I can see this whole thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create at each edge that I wanna be sharp, I'm gonna create a unique polygroup border. Again, this is covered in the first stream. This is using Polish by Features at Polygroup Borders. So I'm gonna go and grab Selection Lasso. And if I control shift click between one vertex point and another on an edge, it removes the complete edge loop. So with symmetry on, I'm just going to disconnect at all the major corners here. Ba Boom. And let's go here, here, and here. And so these are deselected. Now, so I just detached that one face. So if I detach that face, if I now go to polygroups, if a, a piece of geometry isn't touching another, it creates its own polygroup. So if I click auto group, I now get a unique polygroup for each one of those uh, sections that are detached. Now, control shift clicking, bring everything back, you'll see that that piece there retains the original polygroup. So if we go in here and we just take a look, if you do deformation, if we run this polish by features, you're gonna see that what it does is at each polygroup edge, when it meets another one, it's gonna create a sharp edge. So you run that thing, it's gonna start sharpening it out. But if I want to do the strongest possible effect, if I open up this circle, I can run this thing, and then it'll start to like really polish that thing out much better. But the problem we run into here is we have this one edge here that's kind of locking that into place. So you see this one's having a hard time kind of aligning. It's starting to like concave in that surface. So the best bet, if we undo, let's go back here before we do our auto groups. And we're gonna basically just reassign this group to one of these groups. I'm gonna grab the purple. I'm going to go deselect all the other ones. So purple to that yellow edge. And hide that one. Purple to that edge. And let's click, click, and then remove those guys. So we're just showing only these parts. I'm going to do Control W, which is group visible. So now I just reassign that one little edge to this piece. Now these ones look the same, they're different, but I'll click it, do Control W. And this one, let's go and grow all. Just hiding and showing. And then do Control W. And now I should have those little corner pieces. So it's just reassigning that extra little sliver those pieces its own group. So now there's no transition. So if I were to take this thing and do Polish by Features, it's going to start to do a little bit of a better job sharpening out that stuff. All right, so again, if you just run Polish, it's going to smooth it all out. But with those poly groups, if I keep Polishing my Features, it's going to keep sharpening out that piece. So now I get this new little part that I can basically go in now and let's just take this visor and I'm going to grab the outer group mask that thing off. Maybe just like push it out or let's go maybe scale it up. 
so that way it's protruding all the way out of that edge. And then let's go grab this one, mask it off. So you see what I'm doing is I'm leaving the gizmo back here in its original position of the helmet. So if I alt click, it's gonna move it up. So the scale factor, the position of where it's scaling to is this sort of centralized space. But if I leave it in world space and I do it here, it's gonna pull it a little bit further back, which you can easily do just by alt clicking, go to the Home Alone house. <laughs> it literally looks like the Home Alone house, like the cover. But I'll click that thing, it'll send the gizmo back. So then now you got this thing in space, and if we set it to sub, now you can see what's happening. So we're just taking that thing and we're just punching it through. And that's pretty much what I need. Like that's all I really need. Now if I were to take this thing and I continue to run, you know, just take note of the shapes here. Because this piece is, if I turn that thing off, right, when I turn it on and off, you'll see that it's affecting the overall shape. So I don't want it to run into any of these edges. So that's one thing I need to sort of like resolve here, which is probably just gonna be a matter of like polishing the shape out. Since I have those poly groups in there, let's just take this thing and do deformation around the polish by features. We should, when you have the circle open and you keep polishing, what you run into is that it, it shrinks the mesh, but it to, in order to apply a stronger smoothing or polishing, it has to shrink the mesh, which is actually good. In this case, I can keep sort of shrinking until it stops, basically I'm just trying to get it back to that smaller size, since I kind of scaled the outer faces. And then now I'm just kind of running into, okay, I need to check maybe the shape. So I can even go into the move brush here. Or even, if I want to, running a little bit of polish on that thing, now oh, that's gonna break it. I don't want that either. So let's just go and I'm gonna speed up this, the response speed on this. I'm gonna shift click to turn everything off. Let's go do, turn that helmet on. We could even turn live building preview up for a second so we can kind of take a look at this. Now you could just go in and for this piece, like I wanna just be able to grab these borders now. So at this low res state, like something that helps to kind of go through and like smooth stuff out is I can go to the modeler, maybe insert some edges. Now that way, that's gonna change the poly groups. But let's just do, we could do, so quick tip when you have that stuff, we can do group by normals. Well, it will give me a poly group for each one of those major changes. That's, uh, but group by normals didn't keep my originals. So you see it reassigned those guys. Like it's not able to capture these normal angles. So what I'll do is let's go in here and grab, hide and show these guys. Or even better, let's do group by normals. And now this one didn't quite capture. We can decrease the normal angle. Let's keep going. It's almost there. Now you run into like decreasing the normal angle and you might catch poly groups at some of these other faces here, but it did grab the large chunks. So now I can grab this one, hide and show those extra little faces. Looks like there's probably two there too. Oh, no, maybe not. Yeah, right here. And now. And I'll just do auto group here. All right, so doing that, I just added some extra edge loops, which will give me the ability to now mask off that face there. Um, I haven't checked the chat in a while either. Blaze, you're saying, oh nice, so this is helpful for you, good. Yeah, this is, for me, this is the best, the best way to get those nice, clean, sharp edges um, while considering that you wanna be able to sculpt with brushes, right? Like I know there's gonna be people out there who are like, oh, this is so much, I could do this with topology and like build a low res surface and it's like cleaner, but like there's something about the texture and the fidelity of an object that you get when you work stuff by hand and using brushes 
it's more centered in like reality. Like if you were to make this with like just tools and like materials at home, you would work it. You would work more like this, right? So it's just like a, it's a sort of like ZBrush way of like going in and uh, building these shapes. And I prefer to do this kind of stuff while still sort of keeping the the idea of like wanting to sculpt. So like being able to just make a mask on top here, you'll see now what I'm doing is just moving that shell so that boolean doesn't intersect with the top parts that I don't want it to. All right, so this is a subtraction. And again, all I did was mask the top off. So I'm just grabbing that top poly group, masking it, inversing, and I'm control clicking to give it a little soft blur. So that way the edge kind of transitions really nice and I don't get stretchy polygons. And then now let's just go in here and just punching that thing down. When we make the boolean, you see it's giving us like that little slight like edge in there. Now we'll be able to modify that eventually. We'll be able to smooth it out. Once we get a new piece, we can clean up all that stuff on the inside. All right. Now one of the negatives though that I do run into with these multiple edges is you'll see like this is the boolean, you see this little lip here. So that's really coming from the angle in which this thing is going. Now here's, uh, this is maybe just food for thought. When you have multiple edges, if I go in and grab this outer group, inverse that, what I could do from that top view is I could take that move brush and I could start to pull just the solo this out, the transition of this edge across. Right, but with all these edges in there that I added, that basically hinders me from doing something that's actually really powerful for these small little adjustments, which would be, let's go into Z Modeler, I'll delete some edge loops here, all of them basically. When you have no edge loops, here's one of the cool things I like to do. I don't know, maybe it's cool, maybe I'm just a nerd for these little tricks, but now you basically have no edges between this we have this tapered angle going in which is affecting how the boolean is transitioning across that space so if i were to go in and grab with no edge loops here to hold it if i mask out the outside and inverse basically with a move brush if i move this up and move this down i'm changing the angle of that space so it's going up and down so it's able to transition all the way down to that base with no edges so then basically to solve these kind of problems i could go in and just maybe slightly Let's just go through and just grab that top group again, mask it, do that blur again. So that way I'm not touching any of these bottom angles. Now I can go in here and just start to like move this stuff around. And make sure that thing's not hidden in any way. Now bottom edge, let's go in, I'll just keep that mask in inverse, and I'm going to go here at the bottom. So I see that that's cutting out a lot of that original helmet shape, so I'm just going to go pull this thing up. Cool, and then I'm going to clear that mask, let's go in here, and I want to grab these outer groups, mask those off, inverse, maybe do a little blur. So I just get a nice little selection there. And now that section, let's bring that in. Or even better, you know what I want to do is maybe, you'll see like with a brush you get, it's going to be wonky lines. And I want that to cut through eventually. But instead of doing that so that it's not uneven, if we just do gizmo, bring that to the world center, we can just go and maybe scrunch this in it'll be a little bit more effective. Now, to really get the full effect here, I need to punch this whole thing all the way through. So that, that basically means this face is not going far back enough. So let's mask that off, inverse, and pull it back. And let's see, what am I missing? Ah, aha. I need inner shell to be on. That's what I'm missing. I actually didn't need to pull that back. I was just missing a boolean. 
which is that inner shell to subtract from the inside. Um, all right, let me check the chat real quick. Uh, yeah, so Mars attacks great handle, by the way. Um, you're, you you agree, and uh, that's interesting. Interesting thought that it is like it's it's a handmade helmet in the show. Um, the the Mandalorian that makes the helmet, she's like doing it with a hammer and all that stuff. It like it just has that kind of like tactile kind of feeling. I appreciate I appreciate that thought. I <laughs> didn't count you're calling it digital arts and crafts and it basically is it's like the only thing that keeps me sane um, I'm glad you're liking just the problem solving chat that's just kind of like I apologize if anybody hates that because I my streams are like I don't know with any project there's always problem solving no matter what you want to watch people give you a tutorial they give you step 1 through 20 and you can follow those steps but the problem solving part is really when you break away from being uh, it's part of the reason why we make a ZBrush the way that we do, because there's 20 different ways to do the same thing, but you never know what, uh, how you're going to tackle something, and you might want to use some of these tricks later down the road. And for me, that's the best way to sort of evolve as a digital artist, uh, instead of just doing, you know, we're all monkeys in a way, like monkey see, monkey do. You don't learn that way, in my opinion. And I'm sorry if it, it does take me a little bit longer than some, like if I was just doing this, on my own, like this helmet took, to get all this clean out stuff, it took maybe like 45 minutes to do everything we're doing right now. Just if I'm sitting down, going through the process, 45 minutes or less, you know, and that would be like to completion to get this whole thing pretty much like ready to go. Um, but the, I guess the talking note takes me a little bit longer. But the, the last bit here, when you'll notice like I have this extra little sliver that's not quite cut, and that's really just if you look at the mesh, it's just the way that thing's tapered. So again, one of the cool things is with no edge loops in that piece, when you have just an extraction, if I just grab this poly group, mask it, inverse it, um, we could go to brush move, and we could just pull that whole thing down and basically be able to, whoops, with symmetry, pull that whole thing down. Or even use like a, yeah, pulling down is going to be the best. Just rotate to the back. And that's going to cut that thing out. Right, so you'll see that you do get a little bit of stretching happening in there. That sometimes might affect the boolean. In this case, it does not. So I'm not going to fiddle with that too much. Yeah, so one last little thing here is I'm going to go clear that mask. Just pull this little chunk in here. Yeah, so we get account is calling out Michael Pav and yep that dude is awesome at what he does he uses ZBrush the way it's meant to be used which we love and appreciate okay so last but not least we got that little piece that thing's good to go we got our boolean set up now this is like getting the shelling out of these parts and pieces and then eventually we're going to combine, we need to get all this stuff dynamesh together. So we're going to get one solid shelled object. So before I go through, you could, like we could technically speaking, we could go turn on all these other objects, right? And with live booleans, we could take, now this thing I need to reset because that's going to be a subtraction. So I want that piece, oh, it's not this one. I want the, uh, oh, where's the outer shell part? this all right I forgot to do that one little addition here I think I lost that when I rebooted so I could take that little mask here this is one little thing I might want to detail out before I build in it just mask this thing off so I could consider doing like another boolean for this little subtraction or in this case I might just take that thing and mask it off as discussed at the sort of beginning of today. There we go. That thing's looking pretty good. Now my point here was the the bullying bullying these objects. So I'm going through and like adding all these additional components as a final like live boolean if we do all these little subtractions we got going on here and we boolean all these other parts and pieces. 
that's going to create a certain kind of geometry and it will weld everything together. Um, but if I want to do any kind of like additional detailing, uh, resurfacing, like add like scratches and stuff or like any kind of manually textures, the topology that you get from live booleans is not necessarily going to be the best uh, for like continuing to refine. So in my opinion, it's a lot better to basically like keep yourself in a dynamic state, maybe even use Z remesher. We use live booleans to get these parts, but it's not... There's no like linear workflow anymore, especially when it comes to 3D printing, you can kind of bounce back and forth between Dynamesh and Live Williams and Z-Remesh and kind of work back and forth to what you need. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off all these, I don't need these additional components here. I'm just gonna Boolean this shell first. So I get my subtractions and then we'll Dynamesh all this stuff together. That way if I wanna do any kind of cleanup work, smoothing out some of the edges and things, I can do that with Dynamesh. So let's do Boolean. And we'll do, I don't know if I have any, let's do make boolean mesh and just generate this piece. Okay, so new part, U mesh, that's gonna give us that all those clean subtractions. Now that one you'll see like the fastening of those edges. If you want that stuff to be super smooth, let's go in here and let's delete, do it one more time. But this one I'll use dynamic for these parts. So I'm gonna go to the visor here. <clears throat> and where you have if you press D, that turns on your dynamic, which smooths all this stuff out. Now these extractions, I just want to smooth out some of those faceting surfaces, right? You could dynamesh it and smooth it out. That's one way to do it. Or something I like to do for these things is go into geometry, crease, and we could do crease polygroups, which is going to give creases at those borders. So now what you're running into is dynamic without creases. If you turn that on, you're going to get these wonky sort of surfaces. But if we crease those borders of those polygroups and then turn on dynamic, you're going to get super smooth, super clean edges. All right, that's gonna help just soften up those transitions. And I'm gonna go up maybe one more res. So now I get a clean surface across there. This piece, the, the that's that only works really when you have polygroups and like an extraction. But if you take a look at like this part here, the snapshot 3D geo is gonna be a little denser. And this one doesn't have as much of those faceting surfaces. I could easily crease it and turn on dynamic and that will to see it happens like across this space here. Oh, that's on, that's off. You get some smoothing. Um, but it's just a little, just a little detail. Like this one I don't care too much about. I can keep the resolution low enough by not turning it on for all objects. But for that one, let's turn it on dynamic and just make this mesh. Okay, so new piece, booleans are done, nice clean edge. Now, last but not least, let's go into just consolidating. So I'm gonna take this U-Mesh, I'm gonna go back to, I, that makes a new tool. I'm gonna go into my tool here. And we no longer need any of these Dynamesh parts. You can copy, like if you wanna make a new, I wanna get all these subtools, uh, like especially these other components here into the same scene. So if you want to, some little trick you could do is like, I might copy this tool, go paste this tool somewhere else. I'm gonna make a new one. Like when I work on projects, I always wanna have like the live Boolean setup just in case I gotta go back and do it again. Uh, so I keep tools within projects, right? So this tool though, this one I'm just gonna call this like, we'll call this one like the Boolean setup. All right, so that one, this top sub tool is gonna to be Boolean setup. I'll go back to the original. This one, I don't really need uh, let's see, what do I want? I don't, we're getting rid of that helmet. Don't need that. Don't need this Boolean sub. Don't need this piece. Don't need that inner shell anymore. Don't need that. And we just have the components, right? So then here we'll go insert that U mesh. And I'll move that up to the top. And we'll call this just final helmet.
Now we're gonna do a little bit of merging. All right, so we'll take this guy and best way, like this is one thing to mention, I kind of went through and did this already, or as I was modeling in the first video. We're gonna, we're gonna Dynamesh stuff together, right? And when you Dynamesh, you'll notice that like some of these little components here, I made sure that at the borders for all these objects, everything is intersecting. There's not much stuff that has sort of like free floating in space. So for example, like, in, especially since in regards to 3D printing, like obviously if this thing is like floating off in space here, like if it's touching here, when that thing goes to print, if it meets one surface, it's gonna continue to build. But then you have this free floating surface. And when anything's floating, you're gonna get either, if it's completely floating, the thing's not gonna be able to, it'll have to build supports and it'll make it sort of like its own part. If it's sort of connected here, then you might get supports depending on the angle in which you print it. Uh, everything plays a part into like, if I build it, print it from bottom up, you know, I might have issues where supports are gonna be built here and then I gotta break those off when they leave stuff on the model, which is just a lot of cleanup work and destroys your hard work. So in short, all these kind of components, I tried my best to take all these additional objects and not leave too much space. Like there's a little bit of space in there. I think that might be okay in terms of like, I should be able to clean that stuff out, but all the exterior parts, everything is like jammed into that surface and connected. Right, that's the easiest way to just make this a uh, cleaner process so there's no free floating objects and then also that's going to help with the dynamishing part too so in short basically just checking all the parts these additional components even this piece i'm making sure that all the way across the board through the top and bottom it's going to go in and it's going to basically touch it's all touching there's no like no surface is like free floating like this like having a little bit of space in there everything's you know, jammed in there pretty nice. So it's even sort of like converging through the model, like so. Uh, so then I might keep this tool as a setup or we could just take all these guys. I might take this guy here, which still has, it should still have, no, it doesn't have that same Dynamesh res. So, oh, last but not least, before we do this merge, a lot of these subtools are Z-Modeler, right? So I use Z-Modeler and I'm using Dynamic to smooth. So dynamic smoothing is just giving me a preview, but it's shift D and D, and in its current state, it's actually pretty low res. So if I go in here and I set, they're all in dynamic mode, <laughs> I want to merge them all as one subtool and dynamesh. So if we go to subtool here, let's just test this out. We'll go, everything's on, we're going to merge, we'll do merge visible. It's going to make those parts, right? But if you go look, what happens when you do that merge is because they're not subdivided models, what happens is it disables dynamic subdivision and then it merges everything together. So you get basically the low res versions of those pieces, which is not what we want. We want the smooth surfaces. Uh, and then also one last thing too on this piece, like you'll see the merge here, this piece doesn't have all the parts. In the first stream, I actually did, uh, I used a ray mesh to make one part and I'm using essentially, um, let's go check this out real quick, using a ray mesh to make the parts Right, and then going into basically what I do to one thing. Let's do it real quick. Like if I wanted to make some more details on it, it's doing it to all the other arrays. So I can do that kind of stuff, but I didn't apply the array. So we need to do some uh, additional sort of uh, adjustments to these models. So for this array piece, I'm gonna go make the mesh. It's gonna actually generate those pieces. So that way when they get created, they're there. Um, Mr. Sanson, do you use mouse when you use the modeler? Y yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, I would say 70, 30, 70% 70 I'm using the pen, 30% I might use the mouse to kind of go through and do just some specific things. The pen is actually really, for me, it's really nice. Like if I hold alt, that paints faces and I can easily go through and like paint select faces uh, and extrude and do this kind of stuff, right? Which is really freeing. A mouse is a little bit more crude. Um, selecting edges and things like that. Like I actually use, in Zmodeler, we built the tool to be very fluid and very creative. It's not meant to be like traditional polygon modeling. And that's why it works the way that it does. And that's why we have things like QMesh that allow you to do snapping and like remember things to do just like simple extrusions. Um, it's just, it's a different sort of way of building uh, polygon surfaces. So it is truly meant to be uh, accessible with, you know, these kind of tools like using a, a tablet and a pen. 
So I try my best to stay with the pen, actually. And it didn't take me very long to, like, disconnect myself. But, like, sometimes for certain things, I find myself, too, going to the mouse still. Um, and so anyway, so going back to this, I'm generating that U-mesh. <clears throat> Mr. Sanson, you're saying sound is a bit low. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've been dealing with some sound issues today. I can't really do much on my end. Hopefully, you can just maybe turn it up a little bit. Um, but for these additional parts, anything, I'm going to go to the top of this subtool list. So the helmet itself is Dynamesh. Everything else is Z Modeler and Dynamic Subdivision. So what I'm going to do is go in and click Apply to all these things. So I'm going to hit the down arrow key, turn Dynamic, Apply, down arrow key, Apply. So I'm just cycling through these things, applying these dynamic levels. This one doesn't have it. That one actually has physical subdivisions, which is fine. So physical subdivisions, if you merge it, it basically takes whatever level that subtool is at, it applies it in the merge. So when you go back to that merge, you'll see like, this is some a little bit more technical stuff maybe, but like this piece here, right? This thing has subdivisions. In the merge one that we did, you'll see no subdivisions exist. So it applied it and just combined all these pieces of things together. So basically we're just going through and clicking dynamic and applying them as physical subdivisions and then we're good. So you'll see if you take a look at any of these objects now, you go to geometry, they now have whatever level you had dynamic set to, it applies it as a real subdivision. So this helps to then now go in and if I click merge visible, it's going to make a new one. This might take a little longer. And now this one has all the high res versions and everything's looking good. So if you go to geometry, it doesn't keep those subdivisions. It can't because they're different amongst all different subtools. Um, and one last thing you'll notice here, like you'll see one, a couple of these parts are not visible. So this is, when you're using Zmodeler, sometimes you'll have like faces that are flipped or inverted. So if we go to tool, display properties, and you turn on double, you'll see that, that piece is uh, now visible. Only way you can fix that is if you go back to this piece here real quick. If I undo, undo applying those dynamic levels, a little trick that you can do is this already by default has the double side on, which I have in my custom UI. If I turn that off, you'll see that the model by default, usually this is the best way to check. If you go to display properties and if double is off and you see it like this, this means your normals are flipped. And this can happen. This is a very uh, simple thing with Z modeler. Let's just say you have a, a cylinder here. We delete hidden. So the faces, when you rotate around, you see one side by default, it's always showing the outer surface normals. The inside or the back faces, they don't show. So if you use the modeler and you do extrude all polygons and you go away from the surface, it's going to show you the whole model. Now, if I were to take these faces and move these towards the inside, the faces that I can't see in the bottom here, if I push these down, you're basically extruding normals that are flipped now. So you see those normals are basically the inverse version. So this double side is off. If I turn on double, I always the whole shell is always there. It's just how ZBrush displays them. So with double off, if you go and you click flip, it's reversing those things, and now you don't need to basically you won't have that reverse sort of effect. So for these guys, if I literally just go on, that's basically the root of what happens, which I probably use the model around one of these faces and push it out the other way. But if I go click flip, now I get those things back. And if I do that merge uh, one more time, let's go geo, apply those dynamic subdivisions delete this thing, do merge visible. Now I shouldn't have any of those pieces uh, hiding from me in that model. So I don't have to have display properties double on for that to work. Uh, count, real quick, you're saying uh, way to preset Dynamesh to four for all subtools, it's always defaulted at two. At this time, we don't have a way to do a procedural or uh, that sort of like procedural effects to all subtools. It's by default always going to be at two. Um, once you set the subtool itself to a smooth level, it's going to remember that setting. But no, by default, we can't change that at this time. But that's a, it's a good request. That's something that we can maybe put in Subtool Master maybe down the road. Uh, Subtool Master allows us to do actions, apply actions to certain things like, you know, turn on double-sided or, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, I'll make sure to uh, discuss that with the rest of the team. 
All right, so we're cruising along here. We got this thing pretty much good to go. Everything's merged. Now what I want to do is I want to Dynamesh this thing. So I want to run it, I want to remesh everything together. That way, if I need to do any sort of like cleanup work and uh, modeling on top of that, I have one clean surface to work with. So I'm going to take this thing and we'll call this one final element. Let's go Dynamesh here, and I'm going to remesh this around the same. I was at like 15, 1600 at the beginning. I'm going to no, do no sub projection and I'm going to let this thing go. Sub projection is intended to help you when you get like hard edges and creases and borders. But for me, in this case, I want some of the stuff to, you'll get like webbing that happens between sur surfaces, right? So like you'll see if I zoom up here, if I undo, redo, you get that sort of like webbing effect. Sub projection can help with those things, but in my opinion, I, or at least in my sort of like personal workflow, I like the surface that I get there. I can maybe go up just a little bit higher, maybe 2100 with no sub. Sub just gonna change also, I might triangulate those surfaces and things. Usually it depends on like, if I'm just using Dynamesh to create one final resolution piece that I'm not gonna work on, sub projection's awesome. If I wanna work on that surface, do any modeling, sculpting with brushes, I might turn that off. That's just my personal feeling with how I, my experience with the brushes and all that, but it can be really useful. But what it did is it's gone through and it just kind of like welded out all those edges since everything was touching and now I get some nice surfaces. The whole thing is that when this thing is printed, it's gonna read really well for those details. So I don't care too much about these sort of edges and things like that. If I have a problem with that or if you have a problem with that, what you can do, I won't do this now because it might take longer, if you remesh it with project on, it's going to project more of those details and increasing that sub projection, you, you'll you probably get a cleaner result at those edges. But for this, especially for just this demonstration, um, it just will take too long for that thing to process. More settings, more time you got to wait, right? So then moving on to like this final sort of piece here, let's take a look at the uh, sort of like setup in here. Now. Oh, one thing I didn't, one thing I changed here is I do have like some of these additional components happening in this space. Now, if you wanted to, if we go back to the setup, if I don't want some of these components to be in here, this is sort of like an alternate route that you can go. So going back to this Boolean setup, let's say we want to go through and we want to change how we arrange this piece. Like I did the merging of the parts later in Dynameshing. But let's say I want to use this inner helmet piece to subtract and cut away some of these parts. Right? This can probably be uh, a benefit here, so that way, if I do want to wear this piece, right, this is going to be collision and stuff that i got to deal with on the inside. If I want it to be cleaner, then let's go just experiment real quick with maybe doing it an alternate way. So going back to that Boolean setup, what I could do is I could take this helmet and let's move this down the list so we want this piece is gonna be the subtraction at the base. This piece, if I want it to subtract from this part and this part, let's go in here and we'll move these guys. Let's see, how would I wanna do that? Let me move these up, up the list. Let me put those guys above. So moving it above that helmet, the helmet then, whoops, I'm sorry, I need to move that below the inner shell, so this inner shell helmet here, this one. So if I set that one, let's move this down just a little bit. Now that's gonna go through and basically subtract from this ear piece. Yeah, so if I turn this off, and on, or rather turn this one on, I'm trying to figure out how I can show this so you can see it. <laughs> I think you guys get it, but if I move it, you're basically just cutting out that part. So then if I go in and let's take this piece here, move that one above that helmet. And then, so basically hitting polyframe, turning it on and turning it off, which is updating the live Boolean. When you make a change, you have to either turn live Boolean off or on or turning polyframe on and off will update as well. So that's gonna then go through and cut off this piece. This piece here, let's see if we can get that one to go up above that helmet in here as well. That one's working. And then this piece, let's move that one above the helmet. There we go. So now basically just that 
hopefully that makes sense. The edges of that border piece. This is also why the doing the shell part and having the frame of this piece is a better way to have a, a Boolean subtraction as opposed to like a cylinder. Because that cylinder, if you were to go in and just like insert a cylinder into the scene and use that to kind of go through and subtract, the the curvature of that object isn't necessarily going to match where you want to cut stuff out. So it's just going to give you a different shape. But having a shape of the object that you're using tends to help out quite a lot. So then last but not least, this uh, piece here, the mohawk part, let's move that up above the helmet too. And update, and then let's grab, what's that guy? Yeah, this little outer frame here, move that above the helmet. Oh, we gotta just do it all, apparently. Yeah, this array, we need to apply that. So I make those parts, move that up. There we go. Now we're talking. So now we got a super clean inner shell with no extra components. And uh, if I want to move on, like this is the last thing you could do with this Boolean setup is if you go back to that inner shell there, you want to get rid of those wonky surfaces, we can actually go in here, solo out that object, just hold shift, start to smooth that stuff out. voxel looking surfaces here in the back. I'm just smoothing to clean up and I'll turn that off. And now you got a cleaner sort of surface. All right, so then in this case, since we're using that Boolean setup, then we might be better off to just use Boolean to generate everything together. So leaving all these parts on since we're cutting some of them out from this piece. So we'll do dynamic subdivision, make Boolean. And while this is going, it should take a minute or so. Uh, 3D art with Javit, you're saying the Dynamesh model has about 8 million active points. How do you deal with that for 3D print? Yeah, so we're going to decimate. As, uh, count already looks like you answered that. Decimate to keep the shape? Um, absolutely. That will be the final, final step. But we're going to stay in these active point resolutions as much as we can because eventually, like if I do, like if I'm going to split it off where it disconnects at the middle, I'm going to have to figure out a, a way to do this. Or maybe I can find a friend who's got a giant, like, machine that can like mill this thing for me but uh, whatever way I'm gonna do it I might need to split it apart and I need these high resolution surfaces to then maybe make keys at the separation points to be able to lock it into place um, which I'll try to get to uh, as like a visual demonstration here maybe towards the end I talked a lot about this stuff today just the technical process unfortunately what I wanted to get to today with you guys was if you guys are just tuning in later I might have to do this in three streams or maybe four I don't know so I sketched this out this morning for the final this is what I was hoping to spend a little bit more time on with you guys but I want to make a stand for this and I was thinking the Mandalorian sort of rifle like the tip of that rifle would be a cool way to like take it off and put it on like have like a little space for it to connect on the inside so it holds sturdy and uh, so maybe the tip of the rifle and maybe on like a cylindrical base since he does have a lot of those straps and buckles like trying to stay in line with his character maybe doing like the leather kind of belts and some of those components there I don't know if you guys have better ideas you let me know but I'm thinking that's what I want to make for the final once we get this helmet all finished up um, but before I get into like the, the decimating and stuff I need all this stuff in its current state so we're still kind of working it out before and again decimate is going to be what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make all the stuff and then I'm going to uh, update resolutions to scale. And then I'll probably go through and decimate. Because if I update to scale, it's going to give me, we're going to use, uh, for this process, I'll be using Scale Master plugin to output the, up to basically physically change the scale inside of ZBrush. So I'm working in units of measurement. As of right now, I'm working in just default. There's none. So I need to use Scale Master to do that. And if then I find that the thickness or the distances between uh, the objects are, once they're too scale, if they're too thin. Um, I don't think I'm going to have an issue with this right now, just because I know this thing's going to be full size, and I've done the stuff enough where I can kind of visually check and know that that's not going to be too thin. Um, but it's, you know, I want, might want to make changes to that. So before I decimate, I usually leave decimating last to consolidate, but if I need to make changes to the geometry, it might require me to go back and modify the surfaces, which if it's decimated, 
you're kind of SOL, I guess pun intended with my own name. But uh, then you're sort of like spending extra time to go back. So it's saving you the extra sort of time and space to like not decimate too early, if that makes sense. Because I might have to resurface it later. Um, so then going back to this thing, uh, where was I at? I made the boolean. Yeah, so we made the boolean. This piece is done. And we are all good. So I can leave this as is. I mean, I would dynamish it eventually. In this case, you guys watched me just go through and dyna it. But I'll just leave this as like, we'll call this one umesh final. And now we got this stuff good to go. Now, last but not least, since we're, it's already 12.50, I'm kind of getting low on time. Um, I'll maybe give you guys a call out. What would you guys rather me do? I'll spend the next 20, 25 minutes I can either go in and start setting up um, some of these concept pieces. Would you, would you guys rather me talk about for the next 20, 20, last 25 minutes, maybe starting to make some of this stuff? Or I can start talking about just doing like Boolean slices to cut the model, just to discuss like separation. I'm kind of torn and I'll keep an eye on the chat here too. Slices. Linzer wants slices. Um, night, uh, oh, that's Kyle. All right, cool. There's two slices. Boolean cuts, cool. All right. And that's what we're going to do. Now, this one's tough. Like, in, in just in my experience, um, you know, what you can do is you can literally do just, like, hard slices. But in reality, like, if you're sort of thinking this is what I end up doing a lot is if you just do a hard slice, if you have two flat surfaces that meet together, you have to put glue on that surface and then connect to another. And I made this mistake personally, like in, when you're super lazy and you just like want to get it done fast, you can just do a clean slice, print it up in separate parts and glue that stuff together. But the glue expands and it takes up space. So when you glue a surface and you weld it together, then you get, you might get a little bit of a gap, right? Or you might have an issue where you have a sealing problem and you want to cover up those seals when you reconnect it. So I've done this myself uh, and I've sort of learned that lesson. So, uh, just a word to the wise, like it's better to do a slice, but then create a sort of like a plug or a space to then maybe put glue inside and connect those pieces together. So for this thing, like for this part of the space in here, I got a sort of a little bit of thickness and I know the thing is gonna be pretty big. So it doesn't have to be too crazy, but I wanna find a good way to slice. And for me, I guess looking at this guy, I don't see many points of connection where I can make this simple, but I do see maybe just one clean slice down the middle. All right, so just boom, bring it together. That's kind of where my brain's been going. So as I'm experimenting with this, like for example, if the thickness of this piece is gonna be a problem, I can always go back to that Boolean setup and modify that inner piece to maybe take this thing and maybe shrink it down, right? Or rather just like bring that thing in and bring it this way, all right? That's one option. So I could adjust that stuff and come back to it on the fly and just readjust it in the Boolean. But just for the sake of kind of going through this part with this other U-mesh, we might need to do one more Boolean. Now, this is like a little little bit of like a hurdle I gotta figure out is like how to do a clean slice right down the middle. Your symmetry, you can meet, you can find that symmetry line here on the model. And we could use something like slice curve. All right, if you go here, control shift click, you're gonna somewhat find the middle, but slice curve has to travel all the way across the model. So if we do assign a group here, just say I do control shift, drag with slice curve, what it will do, let's say we just draw it like this, it's gonna add a slice edge along that surface, which also gives it polygroups. So then you can grab those polygroups and it basically just disconnects it. So then if you go in here and you do, say split, split hidden, all right, then you'll get these pieces, and but then you run into this where you get space between it. All right, so this is like an old way of working where Dynamesh would maybe work, but if you do modify top bow, close holes, when you get two surfaces together, what's most likely gonna happen is it's gonna close off the whole top, right, which isn't really what I want. That's gonna creating a flat edge. I actually wanna have that thickness. So I basically want these things to close this way. There's a couple ways that we could do that. There's a brush, curve, um, Let's see, which is the curve bridge offers that ability. You can frame, you can go to stroke, curve functions, you can frame the mesh. 
right, which is going to create an edge here and an edge here. If you click once, click twice, it's going to bridge that surface. But sometimes you have issues with that and it creates uh, potentially just more steps. So what I'm going to do instead is let's go back. Let's just use Booleans to do this, just to get a perfect slice down the middle. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a, a trick here to make this work. Let's go in and let's do insert, grab a star. So I want to, I want to just a flat surface. Booleans, you can't use a flat plane. It has to be a complete shell. So if we turn on gizmo, we can click customize and grab this polycube. And a little pro tip, like we're going to use one of these flat faces. I want to give this thing enough resolution, basically enough for text points on that surface. to be able to just have a surface to work with. So we're gonna just use one flat side here. So I'm just kind of up this cube a tiny bit. It doesn't have to be too dense. Okay, we'll call that good, whatever. Now what I'm gonna do is let's go W. Let's see, how do I wanna do this? Let's scale this guy up. <clears throat> so I want to find a perfect center line here, right? So if I were to take the object, we could just set this to subtract with live boolean preview on, and we could go move it. Let's turn transparency off, right? You're just moving that thing in space. But doing it this way, it's gonna be impossible to find the perfect center of that piece if I wanna do a clean cut. So instead, what I'll do is I'll keep this cube in center world space, and there is a symmetry line for the object. If there's not, like if we were to go in and like move this guy off in space, if we go to geometry, modify top, undo mirror and weld, it's going to create a symmetry line right down the middle. And I'm working in the centralized space of the object. And so the object has never left world space, and that's where mirror and weld works perfectly for this. So then going back here, if I do that, leave that thing in the, the center of the space, if I go in and I just grab, hide this part, I'm cutting off that part of the symmetry line, and let's go in here and let's do subtool split hidden. So we'll call this one left sub. And we'll call this one right sub. And for both of these guys, let's do geometry, modified topo, close holes. Oh, delete hidden. No live balloons and close holes. Okay, go back to this guy, double side, that's strange, hmm, very strange, ah, because I set those things to sub maybe? One more time, let me try it this way. Go insert, let's just grab an initialize cube. Bring this guy up. So scaling it, so when you insert an initialized object, uh, Mr. Sansa, will I finish the base next stream? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking ahead right now. Like what I wanna do is, just go through this last little bit of slicing so we can talk about it. But I want to spend the, the next stream going in and actually modeling. So I don't want to get back to the creative stuff and like make the base, make the straps, make the pouches, get all that stuff print ready, make this thing so it's got a little frame to like hold it in space. And then and that after maybe that stream or afterwards, probably after, I'll do the output for scale. So maybe four streams total. So if I do close holes on this one, yeah, okay. Hmm, that's very strange. Uh, what's the purpose of slicing? The purpose of slicing is going to be to uh, essentially create two pieces. So that way when I can, it's basically to print it, to be able to print it at full size in a print bit that doesn't have enough space to fit the full helmet. So when I don't have enough space to print the object entirely as one piece, if I make two, I can just reconnect it and put it all together. 
Um, let's see here, what can we do? I wonder why this one's not working. I don't want to dynamish it. If I dynamish this thing, dynamish will close the holes for the object. Yeah, with Z modeler close, we could try that. I shouldn't have done this. Um, <clears throat> super high res dyno. See if I can kill it. Let's go back, reload this guy. Z modeler, we could bridge. We could maybe close convex. That could be something to try. Naked desk stuff. I know. Oh, well, when I started the stream today, I had a, um, I was doing a Windows update, and I just had some issues with my machine with IT. So I have like fresh desktop and everything. I lost all my backgrounds. And uh, I'm gonna change it. I promise. <clears throat> all right. So let's see if we can do this. Place that with a clean cube. So the clean poly cube works best. Scale that guy up. <clears throat> Geometry, modify topology, delete hit. Okay, so double sided. Let's try that Z modeler. So Z modeler, we can go to edge, close, concave or convex. So we close concave, boom, you get this. We do close convex, you're going to get a triangulated. That one looks a lot better to me. Yeah. Good call out, I like that. And I might just go in and insert some edges here. And then let's do, <clears throat> so now we get this piece. And well, you got that thing sitting right at the center. <clears throat> so let's do, I'm gonna rename this one shell left. I'm gonna do two booleans. I'm gonna duplicate this guy, move it down. So do two start groups, shell left, this will be a sub. And then this one's gonna be shell right. Take this sub here, duplicate that, move it down, and then so two start groups are going to make two Boolean parts. But this one I need to flip over. So you could easily just go to deformation and do mirror in X. Right, so that's just mirroring it over. Or a little tip you could do too is if you're if you're ever not in the center of the world space for some reason and you need to flip something over, you could alt click on a vertex, the center vertex point of the object, and we could use the gizmo to rotate 180 degrees. So you could do it that way. <clears throat> um, so slice curve can't snap to the verts uh, exactly so slice curve isn't going to be able to allow you to snap it's just like basically you're working within camera space so you're always going to be there's no locking to the vertex points itself you can only hold the shift key you hold control shift to draw it shift key will lock straight lines but to try and put that thing perfectly at the center there's no way to snap <clears throat> which is kind of where these tricks have to you have to use these in this way. <clears throat> um, Shonak, yeah, you're saying um, you're working fine. Are you in 20, 20.1.1? I'm curious if it's my, could be my custom UI, which I'm gonna blame myself for using a custom UI. <clears throat> oh, you're, yeah, 2019.1.2 works perfectly fine. Um, it's so weird, I almost wanna check it. This is my development brain is coming into play here now. The geo, delete hidden, double. <clears throat> if I do preferences, config, restore standard. Yep, that's what it is. Standard UI works great. The close holes is fine. It's my custom UI. <clears throat> so something that happens with uh, any of you guys that do use customs, I actually never used to use them and I started doing it since I work in also development and support. Um, people tend to run into issues with um, UIs that uh, 
I've been created in older versions. So like I have my custom UI stuff that I make a version for every every time ZBrush comes out. But the one I loaded today was actually created in 20, I think 2019 was the last time I actually modified it. So I've been loading that in. So for whatever reason that closed holes, oh, and now it's working just fine. So just reloading that thing. <clears throat> but it could have been one of my hotkeys or something that might have broke a button. So just be careful with your custom UIs when you're doing that stuff because that's uh, it, it will have it's it's difficult to use old where buttons are in one place in an old version things change and get rearranged in the new version so if you have a custom UI and you have issues it's best to either try reloading or try recreating from scratch in the latest latest version <coughs> somebody said it's Y2K <laughs> yeah totally I blame Y2K for all my problems. Uh, okay, so we got two booleans. So we're doing a, the subtraction on the right and then subtraction on the left. So we want to make two parts in exactly the same cut. So I'm make, do, making a duplicate and doing the left and right. Now I could go in and do boolean. Let's do no dynamic subdivisions and do make. So having two trees means it's going to make a new UMesh tool and it's going to have both boolean objects in the same tool. Now what I'll get is that cut line that's happening here. All right, so it's going all the way across. And then let's go here. And now you'll see we got a nice clean cut all the way across that piece. Now the cool thing about this is, at least I, this is cool for me, is like I don't have to worry about reconnecting here. This is just empty space. So it really only needs to be happening basically within that front, all this stuff back here. We need to be able to get some clean sort of plugs. And easiest sort of plug that I find, uh, just simple stuff, is just doing like a tapered sort of uh, male and female space. So if we go grab, like we're gonna do a little bit more Boolean stuff in here. So let's go in and we'll do uh, insert. And this is like, here is where I end up having, I get caught up in the technical parts of these, like the way that this stuff works. Like if I have, you see the Boolean is doing a subtraction and it's basically reconfiguring that surface in there so you get triangulated points. So if I go in and I want to make like a, a male and female key, let's go do, this is my go-to trick, is I'll go grab a cube and we'll take this cube down to zero edges real quick and we'll just grab an edge and taper that thing down. Now a cube, like that surface there, <clears throat> Like these are sort of like, it's like a long sort of strip. So I might want to take this thing just to make it shape a little bit better, kind of stretch it out like so. Kind of make a little like rectangular sort of taper. Now we've got this one that I'm going to take, I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to turn on transparency and no solo. Just maybe scale this up. So there's going to be a little bit of space between the inner cut and the outer cut. All right, so we, we're basically leaving, the more space you leave between the, the male and female, you're, the way I think of it is, <clears throat> it's gonna be able to fit in there correctly. If it's sitting exactly on top of itself, it doesn't fit, all right? You need that little bit of space. And also, like imagine if you're putting glue or adhesive so it holds, the more space you leave, the more space you're having, you're leaving yourself for uh, essentially like uh, glue to sort of fit in that space, all right? So a little bit of scale up in there for that glue to sort of fit. And then what I wanna do is, I like to make this as an insert brush and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> uh, inflate rather than scaling. Yes, potentially. Like if we go to this one, <clears throat> we can just take a look at this if I undo that. Let's delete this guy. So duplicate. If you go in and you do deformation, inflate of like five, or let's do 25, 35. <clears throat> let's just do a straight 100. So we get a little bit of distance, right? So in this case, because it's sitting in the world space, it's you'll see that the scale, the way that it scales, is actually form fit a little bit better to the object. 
which is a good call out. If you use gizmo, the position of the gizmo plays a big part. So if it's in the center of the object, you'll see it's scaling from that centralized space. So if I undo any of that stuff, if I alt click to go to the center of the unmasked part, you'll see this is gonna scale pretty much the same way that the object will. So the gizmo, you basically, by default, you'll see when I had the cube, it's sitting up here. But if I alt click to the center, basically when you have symmetry off and you alt click on this, if there's nothing masked, it goes to the dead center of the object, which when you scale with Is transparency not in? Yeah, there we go. So alt click, it's basically changing the pivot of this object, which will scale up like so. So inflate is doing something a little bit more like this, but actually inflate is using these deformation options here. Inflate's using the world center, right? So not the object center. So in reality, you're actually better to use the gizmo because you get the center point of the object as opposed to unify. Otherwise, unify would be your next best option as long as the object is perfectly in the world space. If that makes sense, it's a lot of space, space and time subjects. <laughs> uh, so putting that thing right in the middle is actually giving me a more uh, even scale for that piece. So there's a little bit of distance. <clears throat> Okay, Dougie says he understands. I appreciate the confirmation because I I was confusing myself. <laughs> so we get two objects here. <clears throat> now what I want to do is I want to merge them together. <clears throat> so I want to be able to move them together and then use them as a male and female Boolean in my scene. So if I take these objects, this is the little trick here. If I go to do merge down, always okay. Now they're basically sitting together in space. <clears throat> so one's inside the other. And I want to give them unique polygroups as well. So I'm going to do deformation. I'm sorry, polygroup. I do auto group. So if I click this one, I can inverse and I got this one. So in and out on the same tool. Now, and this is a little pro tip here. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, like to be able to select polygroups, you need to have a vertex point. You'll see with the cube, I stripped away the edges. And I want to keep the symmetry lines here. So I'm going to do geometry, mirror, and weld in X. And let's do floor grid, let's mirror and weld in Z as well. So that's just giving me vertex points here and here. So I have symmetrical axes. So I can click this and I get, it's basically giving me a point to select at the center of the object, which will come into play a little bit later for selection. Now, if we look at this thing from the top view, well, let's just talk about the problem first. So if you go over to our scene where we have our U-mesh parts, <clears throat> if you go subtool, insert, bring in that object. Number one, from another tool, it's a different scale. So now I gotta go in and let's do no symmetry. I gotta scale it. I gotta rotate it into position. And I gotta start trying to bring this thing here to then go into place. Right? The goal is to turn subtract on the live booleans and then have this thing go line up and punch in that surface. Right. So then I'll be able to have that sort of male and female. So right now it's just subtracting. I'm gonna break it off and do an add and a subtract. Or add on one side, subtract on the other. So all those steps is like manipulating and moving it there, which is kind of a pain. So one of the cool things we could do with ZBrush, and this is where the edges, the vertex points themselves come into play, is if we look at this thing from the top, we go to brush and we do make insert mesh. Looking at from the orthographic top, now when I go through, if I click and drag, it's going to draw the mesh outwards from the surface that we're drawing on. Right? So depending on the way I want this to go, I am basically being able to draw this thing on and a surface directly out from that surface. So I'll be able to go back here and I can start to draw this thing into place. Right? And it's drawing outwards from surface normals and it's already locked in. So it's saving me a whole bunch of time. But in this case, I want to do, I mean, add or subtract doesn't really matter. Uh, if we go back to this object here, or this, what is this one? I'm just going to do it from the bottom down. So that way, I'll go brush, insert mesh, new. Now when I draw it, it's going to punch it into the surface, like so. So you see, by default, it's going to draw it, the, the outer face is going to sit on the the surface right at the, the top of that surface that we're drawing on top of. But if I wanted to push in further when I draw it, um, we can go to 
brush. It looks like uh, 3D art with Java. You're saying with Gizmo, one more time. Uh, d let me know what you mean by with Gizmo one more time. If you want me to show something again, I'm happy to. I'm just uh, forgetting what I was doing with Gizmo. But to finish off this part, I'll come back to that if you let me know. If I go to brush, depth, um, if you're like an intermediate user of ZBrush, you're probably aware of this. So the, the brushes themselves, especially insert brushes, we have this depth controller. So this, the circle is the insert object, the piece of geometry, and the, the black line I just kind of call like sea level. That's the surface of the, the object that we're drawing on. So if you push this thing down below that surface, when I draw an insert mesh, now the object's going to push through the surface, so it's now going in. So we want both of those pieces to penetrate both sides, to have a male and female. So you could choose what depth you want it to go. I'm going to go just a little bit further. And then, so that's editing the insert brush itself. And now I'm going to go to one of these sides here. And I'm going to go in here, I'm going to click and drag to draw that thing in space. So click and drag. I, I'm probably going to do maybe a few of them just so it's secure. There might be different sizes since the thickness is a little different as we go along, which I can edit by going back to the Boolean thing if I want. Maybe that's too many. Let's just go like there. And you can add more kinds of keys. Like this is just the most basic stuff. You know, like for me, I'm just giving myself a few plugs to make it secure. So that way, because the problem is that when you run into this, like this is something I've experienced firsthand by doing simple slices. Let's clear this first and we'll split it off. So I'm going to do, uh, I want to split off those objects to make them booleans because we have one shell on the inside too. So we need to get both of them. So if we go, I'm going to just, the easiest way to grab those things and split them off is grab the object we're drawing on. Since what you're doing is you're adding them, they're being basically jammed and merged into the subtool. So if we grab one polygroup or one surface from the object and we do visibility grow all, it's going to grow out to the shell, but it's not going to see those pieces because they're not welded or connected with vertex points. So they're hidden. So now we can go to subtool, split, split hidden, and now we'll get these guys together. So what we should have is, because I auto group them when I made the brush, if I control shift click on the outer poly group, I'm selecting that one. If I control shift drag, it's showing me the inside and the outside. So they're unique poly groups that I can now go in. Oh, interesting. That one's somehow different. Let's do this. Inverse. That one just looks... Very strange. Maybe I clicked the hotkey for it. Okay, let's try this. Control Shift click, inverse that. You shouldn't have this problem. I think I just uh, clicked something. So I'm going to hide this outer group for that one. There we go. Group, group. Let's do split hit. So now you got the, let's see, which one is which? This is the small one. I'll call this one. Male, big one. The bigger one's going to be the female, the cutout. So the small one fits into the bigger one. So they're basically sitting outside of that surface, one or the other. Now we just need to weld. But just to finish my point, the reason why you, I don't recommend doing clean, just hard slices, is because like number one, you'll have like the glue problem. But when you bring it back together, it's going to be hard to like hold it into place to even glue it. It's going to kind of slide around. So what I mean is like. Like when you, if you could accidentally turn it like this and you're trying to put that glue on there by hand, just imagine like trying to glue two surfaces together and keep it perfect so you don't have any offset sort of lines like this. Uh, so the keys, just the more of those keys, they just lock and they hold so it doesn't twi twist or spin. Um, could you make curve male-female connection? Uh, by curve, do you mean a curved brush? Which you could. Um, you could take this insert brush and you could go, so this is just, drag and drop insert. Um, if you go to stroke, curve, and you turn the curve mode on, now you're inserting and you're making a strip of it. So technically you could use this to go draw, you could maybe tell it to do stroke, curve, more stepping, maybe two, and now you get more space between them. 
So you're doing like two things at once, which yeah, that would help. Um, that could like if you wanted to go back to this this guy and start populating those things, right? Like make your draw size the right size. Start doing it like this. You could totally kind of get that working. Um, oh, interesting. That one's flipping. But anyways, that's an option. In this case, like drag and drop for me just a little bit easier. Um, so then let's go back. I'll just set up this. Uh, All right, I'm just checking the chat here. Is it okay if you have triangles and mesh at fingers when doing retopo? Uh, uh, I, I'd say to that, if you're doing retopo for like something organic, um, it really depends. Like if you're doing final retopo for like game or something and you're not gonna model on top of it at all, it's probably fine. You're not gonna run into that many issues. But if you're gonna touch that thing in any way, you're gonna subdivide it, do some more sculpting on it. Triangles cause issues with, um, when you, especially in ZBrush, if you're gonna sculpt and model across that surface with subdivisions or any kind of resolution. So if it's for final output, I'd say you're probably okay. In today's day and age, like 10 years ago, I probably would have been like, no, no triangles, but um, things are getting a little bit more flexible now where you can kind of get away with triangles in some areas. But triangles kind of cause issues with like the projection of like textures through UV maps and things. But uh, nowadays it's kind of just an acceptable norm. But if you're gonna sculpt on that thing in any way, or rather subdivide it in any way in ZBrush, I'd say try not to. Or if you do have to do it, put it in an area where you don't need to touch it. That's usually the good rule of thumb. Uh, move several subtools. If you have multiple objects, if you turn on the gizmo and you click the transpose all, you can now move all objects together. So when transpose all is on, it moves everything that's selected, which by default, it should have everything on. But if you control shift click on a subtool, that basically selects that one, and now if I move, it's only moving that piece. Um, if I control shift drag, that clears the selection. Control shift click and click adds to selections. And then last but not least, if nothing selected, if you control shift click on the document, that inverses the selection. So if you have one part selected, you click, that's reversing it. So the little dotted lines, for this is only when transpose all is on. Um, that means that it's not selected, and then you're moving just this part. So that can be pretty helpful. And when that thing is on, you can also, to select them, you can control shift drag across multiple subtools, and that basically selects everything within that selection. So it's uh, kind of like a masking brush, right? So if you have nothing selected, like when you hold control and you drag across the model, like that's usually, you know, going through and applying, making a selection. We're just using the control shift rectangle to go through and do those kinds of selections with transpose all. Uh, okay, so let me just, get through this since I'm already going a little past my time. So we got the, uh, let's go with the right side. The right side, we're going to do the, uh, let's do the female. So we're going to do one more boolean. So helmet, female selection, we'll move this one down. So you're basically getting the female selection on one side, and then we'll do a new start group for the left, and then we'll do this piece with, uh, this one's going to be an add. So if we turn off that group, you'll see these ones are getting added on the left, and then this group, these ones are getting subbed on the right. So a little cool trick you could do is if you go, uh, let's just do, if you turn visibility off for the right group, you'll only see these ones. And if you turn on gizmo, the transpose all, if you move this out, just so you can see it, and then turn those on, now we can actually look at what's happening there. All right, so this is what we got going. But if I undo the transpose all, we'll remember undo, undo action, so it puts it back to normal. And basically now we just need to go through and make the boolean. So we've got two more boolean groups, and let's do boolean, make boolean mesh. Uh, Dougie's been a triangle hater ever since band camp. <laughs> I mean, yeah, old school. We just have like a general disdain for them, but it's becoming much more standardized these days. Um, break, break. Eric TW said, can you make the non-active subtool appear as without masked? Yeah, so like if, um, say this one has a mask on it and you select a different one. Hmm. That one doesn't actually show up. 
Uh, but if a subtool has a mask, for that subtool you can go into masking and you can turn off the view mask button, which will hide it. So I keep that in my custom UI because I like to use that a lot. So you can turn this off and then it should hide it or show it if that's becoming like a visibility thing for you. Um, that way it keeps the mask there but it just hides it so it's not in the way. <laughs> Turbo Grappler, this, this is the way. <laughs> this is the way indeed. Somebody had to say it today. Okay, so we just made our U-Mesh. Now we get the two pieces that are now generated. So now you get your little plugs and you got those things good to go. So now when I print it out, I can pour a little glue in there in each one. It'll connect, the puzzle pieces will line up, let that thing set, and then basically I'm, I want to reduce the plugs. Having more space between the plugs should reduce the distance between how much of a gap would exist in the final piece. So that way, what I could do is probably seal it up with paint or putty or something to just cover it up. But these would be my, my print sort of pieces. Um, Dougie, you're saying you just installed the Z upgrader. I had to use install using licenses. Not found contact support. Okay, so you got an error, Dougie. You got an error, but it did work fine. Um, okay, cool. Thanks for the update on that one, because that's that's new. We haven't seen. I mean, this is we're about two days out for twenty twenty point one point one. So hopefully everything's working fine though, and uh, you're at least able to run the version. I'll have to chat with Will about that today. But uh, anyway, so this is where uh, I'm kind of out of time here. I mean, we've gone a little bit over, even though I started late. Um, so then I think the plan here, from here on out, we've got this part done. Uh, this is looking like it's in a good place. And the last thing that I want to do is, for the next couple streams, like I mentioned earlier, is go into my concept. I'm gonna spend next stream, May I might just make the gun. Um, you know, like I, the gun is a pretty fun sort of like workflow. I'll bring up a, another sort of gun I've made that's a little bit similar to the Mando gun. If you guys are familiar with Weta Workshops, um, oh, they're, uh, they have a comic series called uh, Dr. Grodbort. So I made this one back when we put out the, uh, the deformer, the uh, project primitive deformer. So I was doing a lot of modeling with that one to actually do a lot of these parts and components. But this is like very similar to the Mando gun, right? He's got this like very like ornate, uh, you know, kind of like handle and rifling and all these kind of like textures and details. So what I'll probably do is, I think I'm just gonna make the thing. I think it'd be fun to go through and just model out all these parts and components, get it done. Even though I'm only gonna use maybe the front, you guys tell me what you think for that concept. like. That front piece as like the holder built into like a cylinder like a mechie kind of base and I'll talk about I'll just make the belts and straps model all this stuff up make it print print ready and sealable um, and then go through and do the final scale up but for print um, okay sorry you uh, Ibrahim you have a comment you're doing a reprojection all the details after the retopo I'll subdivide and project everything. Uh, Carl, definitely gonna print, I'll probably print the gun. I mean, I, I don't know, for this thing, I think I'm gonna do, I think I'm gonna do uh, just a part. I'm only gonna print maybe this base as like a holder for it. I could maybe try and print the whole gun. That's just gonna be a lot of material if I wanna do it big. This to me, I wanna do this like full size, so it's gonna be about a big so that piece is going to be about this tall ish I'll probably use form printers I think that's the plan right now uh, hold up I want to get back to Ibrahim you're saying you're coming so you were saying oh, okay Ibrahim you were talking about triangles and what your final process is going to be I was saying don't do it if you're going to sculpt so you're just going to reproject after the retopo so you are going to subdivide it. Then I would say if you are going to subdivide it, um, it should be okay. 
doing a projection onto a surface that's triangulated and subdivided is uh, less of an issue than like actually trying to go sculpt over it with a brush. But what you run into with triangles is like this, like I mentioned this earlier in the stream. Like with Dynamesh, you'll get, this, is, this was originally a Dynamesh surface. So Dynamesh, sometimes you get, to in order for it to dynamically remesh, this algorithm, this algorithm does a kind of remesh where you do get triangles, right? Or what you call those five-point stars, which are like big no-nos sometimes, especially in the world of sculpting, because we're dealing, if you're familiar with how subdivisions work, they use you know, a Catmull-Clark algorithmic system to divide the polygons. Now when you divide, at those triangulated points there, what you'll end up getting, I'm just dividing up to, well, I don't know, maybe a little too high, so went up to 50 million. <laughs> 50 million is way too much. Let's go down. 13. Yeah, okay. So you might start to see it in some of these areas. Or if I go in and like cross those triangles, maybe try and do a little smoothing. Mm -hmm. Let me see. There's got to be a part in this model where you start to get. I mean, this one. Zebra's is just working way too well here. Maybe if I go in with a brush and kind of sculpt across that surface, and then let's kind of smooth out. It'll start to happen as you smooth, right? So as you start to make transitions in the sculpture, so we spotlight off. So go up at the higher resolutions. Oh, geez, come on, man. Is dynamic on? You... Hopefully you can kind of see this. But those triangles, it's just little bits of details, but you start to get those little lumps in that surface, right? So like brushes and things start to have problems. You see it like very dramatically when you just take a cylinder, like these polarized cylinders, subdivide that baby up, right? You start to get these polar sort of effects. If you go on with a sculpting brush across that surface, you get this kind of stuff. Whereas quads over there, nice brush control. Here, wonky, right? And that's because you're taking triangles and you're subdividing them. And it's just not giving you enough points in between. Whereas you take a, a four vertex point polygon as compared to a three, depending on the size of that polygon, it just has problems. So again, like with projection, you know, I would say like try and quad it out still if you can. Um, but try it out. I mean, it's uh, you can maybe just take that thing real, just that section that you have, um, break it off, subdivide it, project, and see if you can get any weird errors. But I would recommend trying not to if you're going to deal with any kind of projection or sculpting, but sometimes it works out just fine. It really depends on the shape and size of it. Um, so hopefully that answers. And since you're saying the stock receiver is more interesting, stock and receiver is more interesting than the barrel. Hmm, that's a good thought. Um, okay, that's kind of yeah. That's a good point. Like maybe like this section here, like that part, could be cool too. I like that, because that's actually getting into um, like more of those like tacky kind of changes in there. That'd be fun. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna think about that. Uh, 3D art, you're saying, is it good to make male, female something like hairbrush, so that way, all the way, it'll, to see that it goes all the way through the part as a single complete whole. Um, <laughs> so you said just model baby Yoda wearing it. That's a great idea, actually. Kyle, uh, Kyle, who runs our stream team over here, Pixel Logic, he runs all the ZBrush Live stuff. He, when I first was saying I was going to do this for the streams, he was actually saying I should make Mandalorian helmet that fits that's for Baby Yoda. It's like a Baby Yoda helmet, which would be really sweet. <laughs> But yeah, maybe it could be Baby Yoda. That's a good idea. I like that, too. I mean, I don't want to step on uh, one of our other streamers. I think it's uh, Miguel is doing... Um, if you go to the YouTube streams... Because I think... I want to say Joseph did a Baby Yoda. And Miguel was also doing those uh, recently, too. It might be on ZBrushLive.com. Anyways, um, no, I'm so down. I haven't done an organic piece in quite a while, so it'd be fun to actually do that. But uh, maybe I could just 
do like a team up with Miguel and uh, maybe and or Joseph and just take their model and plug that baby in to like modify it. Um, Abraham looks like, okay, you said thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, it looks like that's probably in line of what you're thinking. You're going to make everything quad so the edge count is going up a lot so you see what you can do. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad that helps. Uh, 3D art with Java. Last question I want to try and resolve is you're saying, is it good to make male, female something like hairbrush? Like, uh, are, you, like are you saying hairbrush? Are you saying like the curve brush hairbrush? Or because we have the groom brushes. I assume that's not what you mean. Um, maybe like the insert curve hair brushes that you get from like Dylan Ecker and those kinds of guys, like these ones that draw on the surface. If you're still there, let me know if you want me to clarify on that. Um, otherwise, I for the male and females, the way I showed you, I recommend doing it this way, uh, doing inserts as like uh, that's my go-to. I don't like to do it any other way, uh, just because I get the most control out of it that way. Um, Stefan, you're saying which for workflow did you use the chiseling for this gun? Oh, um, going back to this guy. I assume you're talking about these parts here. Yeah, so these guys, what I ended up doing was, these are decimated. Oh, you're saying with the, with the brush modifier weld option. Right, so just to clarify with 3D art, with Java, you're saying this guy, where I have the, where you go to the brush, modifiers, weld points, like turning that on to connect it. Okay, yeah, I think um, in this case, no. Just because of the welding, you might run into like, depending on the size and like the connections of those parts, I, I don't wanna weld that geometry in any way. Like I wanna be able to manually use those keys as much as possible. Like when you get into the curve, like the curve has, you might have some problems with it not aligning with the surface as much. So again, the curve, I would try to stay away from the curve because the curve is it's not really meant to be used in this sort of technical process. It can be done, but I just would say you might run into problems. So I would stay away from that and using the weld kind of points. Like you're saying with a, as a single mesh, like with the hair cards, people are drawing those things off. I mean, then you're gonna have one long piece. You could try to make this kind of piece like, um, instead of doing like one cube, you could go and do like this, where you go, subtool split hidden. Say so we take this guy and we go, wait no, let's try this with symmetry in Z. We go to Z modeler, insert an edge here. And then let's mask off these guys, use gizmo with local symmetry. So I'm gonna flatten this. All right, now, so if we go here, grow out, I get a polygroup. So three unique polygroups. All right, so you get one key, start, middle, end. So if we go from top view down, we got a brush, create insert mesh, new. We got a stroke and we turn the curve mode on. So this is drawing it out like this. So this is kind of getting to uh, 3D art with Javid's point. So you could you could actually try something like this. This actually, I would I would be careful with curvature with keys. Uh, I could foresee that being a little bit of a problem. But you can go and you could weld something like this, All right? And then you're running into. We can go back to the mesh shell or the mesh setup with those keys. And maybe let's turn off this one. Go back here. Right, now you could go in and do like a curved piece. Right, it's a little bit smaller. Right, and then you get that piece going in, and you go to brush depth, boom, punch that in a little bit more. This would have to be with both of those shells, though. And what I would say is, if you have, you need to have the inner shell already attached to the model. So this is where the weld points, you're, might, you're probably gonna run into an issue with this. Uh, and I'll see if I can illustrate this. So we got the polygroups there. This one we would have to duplicate and take this piece, go to center of the object, transparency, 
and you're gonna scale that up. No solo, so you get a little bit of distance between it. So they're sharing the same, they can't share the same poly group, I would bet. I've actually never tried this. But the welding of the points is, it's based on distance. So if you make it with two shells in there, stroke, curve, go to brush, modifiers. Let's just see what it looks like when we draw it out with double-sided on. Now, what you should get here is actually, you'll see that the brush isn't even capturing that inner shell. So if I go here, Control Shift A. Oh wait, no, I didn't merge them. That's what, that's the problem. Sorry. Merge down. Now let's try it one more time. Brush modifiers. I'll do weld points here in a second. Double sided on. Now we get the inner curve. Now let's go do turn on weld points. see here. So if we grab the outer poly group, click once, control shift click, grow all. Essentially what's happening here is it's welding both of those. So if you go in here and you take a look, let's say we grab this inverse with double on, grow. If you can see this clearly, these, the edges where they're meeting at the curve point, they're actually welding the two together. So you see, you might be able to see it in the frame. So it's making a little triangle. So it's not capturing the inner thickness, which means that when I grab this thing, I'll actually never be able to grab that inner piece to break off for male and female. Um, so, so, yeah, we are getting a little extra here. But one last thing you can do with this brush is you can go to brush, modifiers, weld points, uh, but in this case, you're not gonna be able to control the distance for weld points. So in short, um, I wasn't sure about this. There is like in geometry modified top, but we have weld distance for how things weld, but we don't have a weld points distance for the curve. So in short, the distance that you're gonna need for that male and female to work is never gonna be able to allow you to stop that thing from welding connecting along that point. But that's something to think about for the future for development uh, for us to consider down the road. Uh, so actually I'm glad we were able to resolve that and now I can actually have an answer for that one but uh, you know the drag and drop insert meshes you're never gonna need that long of a thing anyways it's really it's probably overkill maybe in some one random instance down the road you might want to do that um, but last thing Stefano I skipped apart skipped over your thing um, you were asking about the alphas I was just starting to get to it um, this stuff here the engravings I actually went in Photoshopped out the graphics and I made uh, like a black and white alpha and I actually went through with spotlight or not spotlight But I did just basic projection with alpha. That was how I was able to get this and this one I was basically just making the alpha going into brush standard, you know Drag and drop just dragging and dropping on top of that surface with the alpha. So I just had to make a get that mesh high resolution enough to hold it and um yeah, that works pretty well though, right? You get up close, you might start to see a little bit of loss in detail, but the higher we go in subdivision or resolution, that stuff holds super well. And it'll read, especially if you're gonna print this thing, that would read really well. Um, so yeah, yeah, and my pleasure, Javed. Uh, I'm glad we were able to come to some resolution on that. Uh, it took me a little while to go through it. But it looks like I got to everybody's questions for the most part. I'm sorry if I missed anybody's kind of going through and just like steamrolling through all your questions. But um, so this is part two. It's looking like the plan is going to be next week or next uh, month. I'm going to try and, like I said last week, I'm going to try and stream a little bit sooner than a month. The next one I'll be doing, making this stuff. And I'll take your guys' feedback to consideration for maybe replacing this part with either Baby Yoda or the gun. Uh, sort of like uh, ammo position or the, the main sort of centerpiece. And then last stream, we'll get into doing final scale setup and uh, export for print. Yeah, thank you guys for sticking around and listening to me ramble on and on about all this stuff. I really hope that it was helpful and uh, useful to you guys. And we will pick this up in a few weeks or sooner if I can. So uh, I'll check all of you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, if you guys want to, uh, you know, you guys can... Uh, 
You can follow me here on Insta if you want to follow my stuff. Sir Scallywags, my art this is my personal, which I kind of put a little bit of both up on both of those places. But it would be cool if you guys to follow me, and uh, you can send me messages and stuff there if you guys have questions and all that. Uh, so feel free. I'm I'm not afraid to uh, help some fellow ZBrushers out whenever I get a chance to. So I hope to see you guys. I'll follow all you guys back, and thanks again for sticking around. And I'll see you guys next time.